And we are live. Good evening, everyone. Tonight, we will be discussing the $18.5 million settlement that Tether reached with the New York Attorney General. Months ago, maybe about a month and a half ago, I spoke about the only thing that keeps me up at night is Tether. Because those of us that we have been involved in crypto for an extended period of time, we all knew that Tether isn't fully backed. For every Tether that's in circulation, there needs to be a dollar sitting in a bank account somewhere. For those of you who do not know, Tether is a stable coin. And the whole idea of a stable coin is that it is designed to mimic a U.S. dollar. Now, I did a video the other day where I was speaking about Meet Kevin, where he was uh, promoting the BlockFi uh, platform. And I was saying to you that the whole purpose of crypto, it's designed to get rid of banks and to get rid of custodians and to get rid of middlemen. Yet in crypto, everyone just seems to only care about their bags pumping. So whatever fits the narrative that will make the price of Bitcoin go up, the price of Ethereum to go up, then people will support it. And what I've learned in my short existence on this planet is that humans, if you give them the ability to lie, cheat, and steal, that's exactly what they will do. Uh, for those of you who cannot see me, the reason why I removed my camera is because I'm having lighting issues. You can see like the streak behind me. So I'm having problems with my lighting. So I just simply removed myself. Um, if you don't mind, I'll leave it up. But I just think that it looks bad. Um, but that's why I had um, removed myself because I have the streaks behind my green screen. Um, but yeah, going back to Tether. Um, so I'm going to, okay, well, if you don't mind, cool. So when we're discussing Tether, clearly Tether has been committing fraud. And although they settled for $18.5 million and they admitted to no wrongdoing, if you actually read the actual settlement and read the documentation that was provided, you would know that in 2017, there was 400 and about $42 million of Tether in circulation, and there was only $61 million sitting in the bank account. So now what you have to begin to start thinking is that if Tether can manipulate the price of Bitcoin up, then they can definitely manipulate the price of Bitcoin down. Now, the same individuals who own Tether and created Tether they also own an exchange by the name of Bitfinex. And this is why it's important that you start understanding these things and putting things into the proper context. Bitfinex was allegedly hacked for well over 60,000 Bitcoin. And then they were hacked quite a few times. And a lot of people believe, again, we don't really have any proof that this was an inside job, that the Bitcoin never really was hacked, that Bitfinex was behind the hack, and that magically, they had, you know, a cash shortfall and Tether magically extended them a line of credit. But when we start getting into the documentation, we can see that they were basically co-mingling funds between the funds that were designed for Tether and also the funds that should have been separated into the Bitfinex business. And when I see people like Anthony uh, Pompliano, and I want to go here and pull him up because I just think that this is important to know what type of people we're dealing with. Right. So here he goes, Tether is the biggest racket ever. Highly doubt it is actually pegged one to one. And this tweet he put out December 22nd, 2017. Then now he's saying, remember that Tether FUD? This isn't FUD. And for those of you who do not know, FUD in crypto stands for fear, uncertainty and doubt. No, Tether has clearly been manipulating markets. And as I said before, if you can manipulate the market up, then you can manipulate the market down. 
So now the next question we have to begin to ask ourselves is, did Tether have something to do with the 2017-2018 crash? Right, because where did they make up that, you know, 300 to 400 million dollar shortfall? How did they make up all of this money? So there's a lot of things that we need to definitely um, get into and, and just start looking at because uh, there's a lot going on here. And this is why I'm a huge, huge proponent of dealing with decentralized protocols and not dealing with centralized exchange exchanges like the Binance Smart Chain or dealing with USDC or dealing with Tether. Because again, if you allow humans to lie, cheat, and steal, that's what they would do. The whole purpose of crypto is to get rid of middlemen, to get rid of custodians. Yet somehow in crypto, we are centralizing this and championing this as if this is good. This is horrible. And when you see the crypto media, people like Frank, and they're sitting up here saying, Bitfinex Tether settles with the New York Attorney General for $18.5 million. Um, and then it says, Contrary to online speculation, there was no finding that Tether ever issued Tethers without backing or to manipulate crypto prices, said Weinstein, a former federal prosecutor. So this is not the people that were prosecuting um, Tether. This is just a former prosecutor. And to watch the crypto media say these things, it's just absolutely not true. Like it's in the actual documentation. So now what you have to start asking yourself is who do you listen to? Because clearly many of the Bitcoin maximalists, they're just shells. Let's just keep it real. They do not care about decentralization. They only care about the price going up. And we clearly know that now by watching them blatantly categorically spin this as if this is somehow a win, because you may have escaped the New York attorney general. But now what about the DOJ and what about the SEC, right? These are things that you have to start thinking about, right? So just keep these things in mind when you are investing and you are messing with these centralized entities that the back end of crypto is an ugly, ugly place. And if you can avoid using anything centralized, you should do that because it's highly manipulated on the back end. Crypto the actual cryptocurrencies, they're, they're doing what they're designed to do. It's the structure and the infrastructure around crypto that's corrupt, whether it's the exchanges with wash trading, with them front running your orders, whether it's the bank accounts and how they're co-mingling funds. These are all of the things that you should be definitely keeping in mind as we go forward. So we got some things to discuss. Also, um, I believe MicroStrategy is starting to invest some more into Bitcoin. Uh, we're going to cover Square purchasing another $170 million worth of Bitcoin. That's positive. But um, I, I guess I'm the only one in crypto that wants to keep it real with you and not sit up here and shill you, um, you know, that everything is great. No, this Tether stuff is something that you should pay attention to because now also think about this before we get into some housekeeping. It took Tether and Bitfinex two years to reach this settlement. So now think about Ripple, right? For a lot of you that you're Ripple bulls and you believe that Ripple is just going to settle their case, they most likely will end up probably settling with the SEC two years later. So for your Ripple bag to pump, it may take you two years. So you have to ask yourself these questions, right? Um, you know, do you want to hold that Ripple bag for the next two years while they're going through their litigation process? Because very similar to Tether, Ripple is going through something similar in terms of market manipulation, in terms of founders being able to have an unfair advantage over those of you who are investing. So, you know, all of these things you need to make sure that you are keeping an eye on. Where there is centralization in crypto, there's fraud. One thing I've learned in my eight to nine years that I've been doing this is that where there is smoke, there is fire in crypto. Always remember that. This is the one industry that if it walks like a duck and it quacks like a duck, it's a duck. If it looks like a scam, if there are rumors about it being a scam, then most likely it's a goddamn scam. 
And I don't have time to play games with stuff that actually, you know, can make me lose money. So please do me a favor and like this video, share this video, subscribe, make sure that you hit the notification bell that you set it to all so that you can receive all of my notifications when I go live. Also, you can join my mailing list so that you'll be notified via email when I go live. You can also join my mailing list in the description below. Simply click the link, um, join the mailing description. I think I just said that. Um, also, you can follow me on Instagram. A link to my Instagram is in the description below. If you're interested in learning about crypto, joining a community of like-minded people, I created my tech Academy. We currently have a free three day trial. You are welcome to definitely come and try it out to see if you like it. Uh, we focus on all of the things in terms of, you know, storing your cryptocurrency, the ledger, how to buy it, different exchanges, and most importantly, just creating a safe space where you don't have to worry about someone shilling you a bunch of, uh, you know, worthless garbage and coins. I think that that's really one of the most important things. When I first got involved in crypto, there weren't any real communities. It was really just a Bitcoin talk forum and you didn't really know who you were talking to. So a lot of you, you're lucky that there's so much infrastructure built now and people that you can learn from. But again, as you as you're going to see today, go and look at your timeline. How many people are actually going and pulling up the actual documents and looking at what Tether is accused of? Right. And this is this is serious. I wouldn't even say accusations because I mean, at this point, this is factual, right? Because it's over. They settled this. And I just want to read line 21 and I'll share this with you. So I, I want to correct myself that this isn't, you know, allegations at this point. This is actually verified through banking records and emails, et cetera. And they actually settled to this right here, you know, on line 21. It says between June 1st, 2017 and September 15th, 2017, Bitfinex held approximately $382 million of Tether's funds in a co-mingled account, which should have been held by Tether. Remember, the whole idea of a Tether stablecoin is that there needs to be a dollar sitting in a bank account somewhere, right? So this is a centralized stablecoin, and they're saying that they're going to create that digital dollar because they have a physical dollar in their bank account, which should have been held by Tether as backing for Tethers then in circulation, but was not. In certain documents, Bitfinex and Tether produced to an OAG during its investigation. Tether accounted for this amount as a receivable from Bitfinex between June 1st, 2017 and September 15th, 2017. The total amount of tethers issued and circulation rose from approximately 108 million to 442 million. Now let's get down here because give me one second right here. And on line 20, it says because of tethers inability to conduct significant banking activity during this time, it could not itself hold dollars sufficient to back the hundreds of millions of new tethers that had entered the market until September 15th, 2017. The only US dollars held by Tether ostensibly backing the approximately 442 million Tethers in circulation was approximately $61 million on deposit at the Bank of Montreal. Very, very simple. 442 million Tethers in circulation, only $61 million backing them. Think about that. $61 million backing 442 million tethers. So a lot of you are probably saying to yourself, well, you know, I don't care. The, the, the price is going up. Again, if they can manipulate the price of Bitcoin up, then they can manipulate the price of Bitcoin down. And now you have to start asking yourself just from a, a fundamental purpose and standpoint, why did the market crash in 2017, 2018? Bitcoin is no different today than it was in 2017 and 18. 
Bitcoin is no different. So knowing that Bitfinex was hacked, knowing that now all of a sudden now they finally came up with the reserves because now as of today, Tether is fully backed. Where did they make up the $850 million? Now, this person said all markets are rigged. It's not a matter if all markets are rigged. These markets were designed to be decentralized. People are willingly centralizing in these markets. See, this is what a lot of you, I'm not surprised that fraud is happening. I'm not a newbie. I understand fraud's always been going on. That's not the question here. The question is, why are so many people sweeping this under the rug as if this is not a serious issue? See, when you because now what you have to start saying to yourself is why did the market crash 85 to 90% back in 2017 and 2018? What fundamentally happened in the market? Because if they can do it then, then now you have to start asking yourself, can they do it now? And then what you have to also start asking yourselves is that if your favorite, if your favorite, where is he at right now? If your favorite influencer in 2017 was pushing a narrative that Tether is the biggest racket ever, highly doubted is actually pegged one-to-one, -one, but then today's tweeting out, remember that Tether FUD, that's not something that, that's not someone that I want to follow. That's not someone that I want to follow that is not going to keep it real with me. So these, these things matter in a major way when you start thinking about the structure of the market and what's going on here. Now, some people are making the argument that, well, it's hard for crypto firms to get banking. So because it's hard to get banking, this is why people had to go to the fringes and different. And I get all that. I understand about Operation Choke Point. Um, I honestly believe, and I know I shouldn't be saying this publicly, but I don't care. I believe that the CIA is behind Tether. I honestly believe that when you start looking into a lot of the documentation, I believe that this is the government coming into and purposely doing these things because it's just, it's a lot of shady people behind Tether and how they're doing and conducting business. And I believe that the, this is the feds trying to come in and co-opt crypto in my personal opinion and this is why i try to say before you know you have to be a four-dimensional thinker not even a three-dimensional thinker right you 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 have to think bigger than just your bags pumping because this technology is highly disruptive to the status quo and understand that they cannot stop the technology but what they can do is they can create choke points around the technology and this is why i'm so big on decentralization because when you start understanding that if you promote decentralization, you don't fall for garbage like this. Because again, if they can't control the technology, then they can control the on-ramps and the off-ramps. Off -ramps. How do you get fiat dollars into crypto? And that's where the choke point is at. How do you get fiat dollars into crypto and how do you get them out of crypto? So if I can't control the technology, but I control the on-ramps, then I still control what's going on. Right. And these are these are reasons why you have to make sure that you're paying attention to what's going on. And you're not just being a dumb moon boy and saying, oh, number go up, laser eyes. No, you have to be thinking on a deeper level because I have lots of money invested in this stuff. So I'm always thinking bigger and I'm not thinking smaller. Many of you think micro and you don't think macro. So anyway, let's get to the article. Enough of me rambling um, just to cover some of this stuff. And then we'll get into some positive things. I know you just only care about your bags going up. But for those of you who care about the more important stuff, like, because what good is it if your bag go up if you can't cash out your bag? And thank you guys for the donations. Uh, I appreciate it, right? Because see, a lot of you don't think big enough. Like, what? well, what good is it if your bag pumps if you can't cash your bag out? <laughs> so these are things that you have to be a little bit mindful of, right? So. A closely watched legal case involving Bitfinex and Tether with major implications for the cryptocurrency industry has been resolved. The New York Attorney General's office has settled with Bitfinex over a 22-month inquiry into whether the cryptocurrency exchange sought to cover up 
the loss of $850 million in customer and corporate funds held by a payment processor. The New York Attorney General's office announced the settlement Tuesday, formally ending the inquiry that kicked off the April 2000 kicked off in April 2019. Under the terms of the settlement, Bitfinex and Tether will admit no wrongdoing but will pay $18.5 million and provide quarterly reports describing the composition of Tether's reserves for the next two years. More significantly, these reports will match information Tether already, already provided the New York AG about its reserves. And I want to take a step back, right? I know a lot of you don't want to hear this. You're going to say, oh, race, race and racism has no place in this. George Floyd had a knee put on his neck for eight minutes because he passed the fake 20. I want you to think about that for a second. Here you have a black man passing a fake 20. He gets a knee on his neck. Yet you have executives and CEOs of a company who were laundering and defrauding their customers of billions of dollars, billions of dollars. And yet <laughs> they pay an 18 Point five million dollar fine. You know, as I as I get older and I I start to get a little bit more, I would I guess you would say wiser. You cannot deny the corruption that's in your face. Whether it's Robin Hood shutting down GameStop, whether it's the pandemic that happens and they only give you six hundred dollars but the Fed puts together trillion dollar lending facilities for Wall Street or whether it's, you know, because we're going to get into a lot of the articles and dive deep or whether it's, you know, Tether ma magically coming up with eight hundred and fifty million dollars right around the time when it's time to come. In. You know, it's just it's it you 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 look at this and you start asking yourself some 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 serious questions, um, you know some serious questions as to how how the society is structured and why we need crypto, why we need a better system. Like the man got a knee put on his neck for a fake 20, <laughs> you know, and yet these people, they're walking free and they, they literally defrauded people out of billions of dollars. Uh, you know, it's just disgusting when you think about it, man. Right. It, 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 it's, it's disgusting when you think about it. Um, so in a statement, New York Attorney General Letitia James said Bitfinex and Tether recklessly and unlawfully covered up massive financial losses to keep their scheme going and protect their bottom lines. Tether's claims that its virtual currency was fully backed by U.S. dollars at all times was a lie. Period. And again, you can come to the documentation you can look at line 20 and you can see they had 442 million tethers in circulation and there was only $61 million actually backing the 442 million tethers in circulation. Um, Alexander Wilson, is the NVIDIA GPU Ethereum mining a fad or is it going to be here for a while or does new technology replace it? The mining space is always competitive. There will always be new technology coming into the mining space. Uh, the Ethereum mining algorithm is ASIC resistant. So that that's one of the, the, the pluses that is basically resistant to ASICs. But um, what I will tell you about mining is mining is heavily industrialized. And basically, you need some real money to get into mining. Either you need extremely cheap electricity or you need you know, some serious money to get in there and do some damage. And that's just the reality. I know people are going to try to sell you that you can build your own mining rigs and you can, but by time it, like, for example, I live here in New York city. It's 17 cents per kilowatt for energy for me, for electricity. It just, it makes no sense whatsoever for me to mine. Right. I, I just, I can't make any money. Um, for, for those of you who may live on the West coast and you have renewable energy, or like I said, or cheaper free energy, then it would make sense. This is why so much mining capacity is in China. It has nothing to do with China controlling Bitcoin. It's just a function of market dynamics. China has a lot of dirty energy. 
So, and they also have a lot of hydro dams. And they also have a lot of silicon manufacturers and chip manufacturers in China. So based upon logistics and based upon the fact that they don't care about their environment, this is why so much mining is in China. It's not because China controls Bitcoin. It's because the market is saying that energy there is cheap, right? What you have to understand is that there's something known as economic game theory. So when you see idiots like the Ripple Tards talking about, you know, all of the mining that's happening in China, think about this. Economic game theory depends on rational actors. As a miner, you have to spend lots of money. In the case of an industrial size miner, you're spending millions of dollars on mining equipment and you're spending millions of dollars on electricity and energy. It's going to take you anywhere from a year to a year and a half to break even on that equipment, if not turn a profit. So you're not going to take your mining capacity and try to attack the network because an attack on a network is an attack on yourself. It's common sense because if you attack Bitcoin and you hurt Bitcoin, then your mining equipment is useless because miners mine Bitcoin. They receive the block subsidy plus the fees, and then they sell that Bitcoin into the market to cover their energy bills and break a profit. If they try to 51% attack or do a block reorg, right, or do a double spend attack, they essentially are basically shooting themselves in the foot. So understand that the way Bitcoin is designed, it has mechanisms and game theory where everyone is incentivized to play by the rules. So when you see idiots talking to you about, oh, the mining is centralized in China, that, that, that's a function. That's not the protocol that's centralized. See, this is important that you understand the difference between the protocol being centralized and just the fact of the market dynamics. Understand this, that there are people that have billions of dollars invested in Bitcoin. They have mining capacity here in the States in the event that, let's say, China decides to do a double spend attack. It's very hard to get 51% of the attack into attack it. Most blockchains are not attacked by a 51% attack. Most flaws in blockchains happen because of errors and bugs in code. That's the worst thing that you have to worry about. The only problems that Bitcoin has ever had in its existence has been the inflation bugs in the code. When the Bitcoin Cash developer found the inflation bug and the previous inflation bug back in 2010, that's what you have to worry about. Stop listening to people giving you a bunch of FUD. That's FUD, fear, uncertainty, and doubt. Just keep these things in mind. Um, thank you for the donation. I, I saw a few donations come through. Uh, thank you, sir. General Pop, either forget. Give them a chance and they will send. Thank you for the donation, Lamar Morris. 100%. Yeah, give give them a chance and they're going to stale. Uh, what exchange do you recommend? Um, I mainly... so. If you're if you're transacting, if you want privacy, right, there's a spectrum. I just did a live call for my members inside of the academy. There's a spectrum. You have BISC. That's a decentralized exchange. You can get you some Monero, you get you some Bitcoin there, right? No KYC, no AML, but you are using your bank account. So be mindful of what bank account you use in order to get fiat. But it's decentralized, right? So you when I say no KYC, KYC stands for know your customer. AML stands for anti-money laundering, right? So you don't have to basically upload a picture of your ID and all of that in order to use BISC. And that's a way of getting fiat into crypto. Um, but the BISC exchange is clunky. It doesn't have a good user experience and it takes some getting used to. But again, it allows you to be anonymous or you could do things like local cryptos. In some instances, you do have to KYC with that as well, depending on where you're located. Um, or you can go the centralized route. Like most people I recommend, start with a Binance US or Coinbase US, put some fiat into there, and then you can run your crypto through a Tornado Cash for more privacy. You can use the Atomic Wallet and swap in and out of Monero uh, because Monero cannot be tracked, especially if you're using it the right way. Um, so again, like I said before, there's a spectrum. Um, as a newbie, simple answer, Use a centralized exchange, get comfortable with sending crypto back and forth. As you get more experience and you start seeking more privacy, go the BISC route, run through Tornado Cash, run through a DEX like Changely, and you'll be fine. And I cover all of this inside of my course in the academy. So for those of you who are interested in learning about this stuff, um, you know, definitely make sure.
that you um, take a look at the course. We have a free three-day trial. So let's get back to the article. And thank you guys for the donations. I hope I answered your questions. If I didn't answer your questions, I could definitely answer you. Uh, an ASIC is an application-specific integrated circuit. So the, the hashing algorithm for Bitcoin, when you create... So China, Bitmain makes these um, specialized computers, right? Where all they do is they basically ser um, solve the cryptographic puzzle for Bitcoin, right? They keep hashing. They just do SHA hashes all day long and they do the SHA-256 hash. And they do it extremely well because this circuit is only designed to do hashes for SHA-256. With your GPU, your your, your GPU is, has a whole bunch of different utility and use cases. So therefore, GPUs are not as efficient as in uh, ASIC miner, right? So ASIC miners are very efficient at mining. They use less energy and they're very, very good at basically sh solving SHA-256. The problem is that's all they can do. So people buy these really, really expensive miners and they run them so that they can mine more Bitcoin more effectively and faster than you can with your GPU. That's basically what an ASIC is, right? An ASIC miner is an application specific integrated circuit. That circuit only mines SHA-256. It cannot do anything else. Um, so I want to get back to the article though, guys, before we, before I, I deviate too far off. Um, so the settlement may help resolve one way or another, a question that has long bedeviled the entire 1.6 trillion dollar global cryptocurrency market by requiring tether to provide a greater level of transparency than ever about the backing of the usdt stablecoin a foundational piece of crypto's plumbing the arrangement could replace whispers and conjecture with regular data depending on the level of detail provided investors could have better tools to evaluate the claim that the company has been printing unbacked tokens to artificially drive up the price of Bitcoin, the market's bell weather. So, resolves allegations. Charles Michael, a partner at law firm Steptoe and Johnson LLC, who represented the companies in the inquiry, said the settlement resolves allegations about public disclosure around Tether's loan to Bitfinex. To the Attorney General's office credit, after two and a half years of investigations, its findings are limited only to the nature of the timing of certain disclosures, Michael said. And contrary to online speculation, there was no finding that Tether ever issued Tethers without backing or to manipulate crypto prices. That is a lie. <laughs> it's just, it, it's... It is amazing to me how they could just, you know, spin this like this. It's just, it's, it's crazy. So, um, I want to get into this right here. This is a really good thread, right? Rather than reading a whole article, it makes no sense. So this is from whale circle. It says tether price manipulation scheme. This detailed thread will dive into the realm of tether and explain everything you need to know about the controversial coin. The public deserves to know the truth about tethers role in manipulating Bitcoin prices for years. Now, understand here that we're not talking about something small here tether is the fourth rank cryptocurrency has 34 billion dollars in it right so we're not talking about something small right and so let's not just dismiss this as this is just oh something small that we can forget about so it says for the last sev for the last several years tether and bitfinex have been swarmed with dozens of controversies this thread hopes to share the light on what's actually going on and assist the public in avoiding massive losses from the ticking time bomb and fraud scheme. Stable coins are cryptocurrencies that claim to be pegged to another asset, usually the dollar. With double the volume of BTC, Tether is the most popular on the market. The issue with Tether is there is zero evidence that suggests they are fully backed with the US dollar. In 2012, iFinex was founded in Hong Kong and launched in the British Virgin Islands. Two years later, Bitfinex and Tether are created. In 2015, Bitcoin drops 87%, its largest bear market ever. Bitfinex lists Tether, uh, Tether and liquidity quickly returns, fueling the bull market. This is the chart right here. So Bitcoin crashes down. Then we get Tether, and then the market starts to go up. It wasn't until years later that leaked documents, Paradise Papers, 
revealed Bitfinex and Tether are run by the same individuals. For years, Tether and Bitfinex lied and said the two operations were separate, but the leak proved otherwise. And again, if you're an OG in this space, you would know that Tether lied for years and said that they were not linked to Bitfinex, and they actually were. In 2016, Bitfinex claims it has been hacked again when 119,756 BTC worth $72 million at the time vanish. A lot of people believe that that was an inside job. And, you know, I, I take this stuff serious because I lost a lot of money with Mt. Gox. So, you know, these hacks really start making you wonder how are these people so smart, so intelligent, they've been working in cybersecurity and infrastructure, you know, you know, IT for so long, but yet they can't build a working website where they're always getting hacked. And then nothing ever comes of these hacks from these exchanges when your Bitcoin goes missing, right? You have to think about this and ask yourself, you know, is this an inside job? This is one of the largest hacks in Bitcoin history, second only to Mt. Gox. Bitcoin plummets over 20% and Bitfinex never discloses any details of the breach. Days before, Bitcoin tops out at 20,000 in 2017. The CFTC subpoenas Bitfinex and Tether. The actual documents are not made public. Without any formal announcement, Bitfinex suddenly closes all new account registrants, registrations. A few weeks later, Tether's legal team states Tether tokens will no longer be issued to U.S. citizens. Tether also suspiciously, suspiciously cuts all ties with their auditors and claims an audit wouldn't be possible due to their complex balance sheets. How can it be complex? One dollar comes in, one tether comes out. Now, again, if you go and you read the actual documentation, we now find out that there were commingling funds. Remember, tether is a separate business from Bitfinex. Even if they were owned by the same entity, the accounting should still be separate. There's no reason why the actual tether funds should ever end up in the Bitfinex bank account. Very, very important that you understand this. So it's not com complex. And Tether's never actually had an audit by the big four, the big four accounting uh, you know, firms. Keep that in mind. This chart shows the strong correlation between Tether printing, unbacked dollars, and Bitcoin's price. Through 2021, we see record amounts of Tether being printed, which is followed by huge bull runs. And we all know about the Tether brr. Right. So everyone I remember back in the day, we used to literally sit there and watch Tether and see like once they print over a certain amount and then you would try to front run the price of Bitcoin. Many claim that without Tether, Bitcoin wouldn't be affected. Tether makes up massive amounts of the market. Data shows that almost 75 percent of all volume on Bitfinex, Tether's subsidiary, is from USDT. The issue with Bitcoin is it's being artificially propped up by corrupt by a corrupt company. Bitcoin itself isn't a scam, but Tether is. Once Tether is removed, we could easily see an 80 to 90% market decline and devastating liquidity crisis 1,000 times worse than Mt. Gox. I do not believe that at all. Um, I don't believe that at all. But again, just keep these things in mind. And let's just read a couple more threads. In 2019, New York Attorney General sues Tether, Bitfinex, Tether and Bitfinex are now involved in a massive price manipulation and fraud lawsuit. They, of course, deny any accusations and it and call for it to be ended. Tether's lawyers admits they aren't fully backed. Tether's own lawyers signed an affidavit, a David, and admitted that Tether wasn't backed one to one with the dollar, but rather only has reserves to back 74% of its stable coin. So we know for a fact, based upon the lawyer signing an affidavit stating that they're not backed one to one. Why? I know what you're saying, okay, well, what does this have to do with my bags pumping? You have people in the crypto media, crypto journalists like this guy here, Frank, saying that Tether settled an $18.5 million. They basically settled for $18.5 million and that they admitted no wrongdoing. 
but there was wrongdoing. <laughs> like I, I just I I can't believe that so many people in this space think that like they think that this means nothing, like that this is good, that this is just fun. You have a stable coin that's supposed to be fully backed one to one. If they can manipulate the prices up, then they can manipulate the prices down. I posed this question earlier and I'm going to say it again. Why did the market crash in 2017, 2018? See, no one asks these questions. Bitcoin is no different today than it was in 2017, 2018. So why did the market crash 90%? There were no hacks. There were no security flaws. Why did the market crash? Or could it be the people who manipulated the price up then manipulated the price down? Things that just make you go, hmm. I, to this day, still can't understand why the market sold off in 2018. Just don't know why. But again, you could go here and you can look at the affidavit. It's all right here. Um, I'll share this with you in case you think I'm, you know, spreading FUD. Just, you know, sharing some common sense with you. I named my channel What Happened to Common Sense. In December 2020, New York Attorney General says they anticipate the handover of loan documents. Weeks later, Tether confirms they sent over 2.5 million documents to the New York Attorney General. Around this time, Tether stops printing for eight days and the prices of Bitcoin plunges 19%. <laughs> An attempt to regain public confidence in Tether, this is very important, in an attempt to regain public confidence in Tether, Paolo Ardrino and his lawyer, Stuart Hoganger, go on the What Bitcoin Did podcast by Peter McCormick, avoiding all important questions about being backed. Many claim the podcast was fully scripted, and it was. Peter has strong ties with Tether. Not only did Tether fund one of Peter's personal lawsuits, but they are also an indirectly sponsor of the podcast. Tether is a main sponsor of Kraken, which is the largest sponsors of the propagandist podcast. This is why I don't take any Bitcoin maximalist serious because I know that these people are not genuine when they're sharing information with you. They only care about the price going up. And I know for most of you, that's how you think. I need to know, I need to be on the inside so I can know when to sell. Right. So I'm looking at more important things than just what Pomp is telling me or what Peter McCormick is telling me. It's important because these people have large followings and people are fanatical and they basically do whatever these people tell them. What you have to start saying to yourself is you need to learn how to eat the meat and spit out the bones. I don't give a damn what Pomp says. I don't care what Peter McCormick says. I follow my own intuition and I follow my own research. Do not allow these people to sell you on things that you do not understand because we're, we're starting to see that these people are controlled. Are controlled. Yes, I saw Peter debate Richard Hart. Richard Hart is by far one of my favorite people in crypto. A lot of things that I've learned, my ideology and philosophy around a lot of my, you know, just investing strategies comes from Richard Richard is by far one of the brightest minds in crypto, and he's a truth teller. See, it's important that you listen to people that will tell you the truth, and then you can go behind them and look it up. Um, when you go and you look, watch Richard debate Peter, he destroy. Richard destroys Bitcoin maximalists, just destroys them, because their, their ideology is foolish. Remember, I tell you guys this all the time. Bitcoin is just the tip of the iceberg. This technology is way bigger than Bitcoin. Currency... And a store of value is a small use case. When you start thinking about finance, finance is much broader than just storing value. Finance is borrowing, lending, capital markets, debt markets, insurance, mortgages, derivatives, exchanges, right? All of these things are part of finance, right? Time lock deposits, right? CDs, all of this is a part of finance. Bitcoin cannot do any of those things because of the scripting language that it utilizes. So how are you going to have a new monetary system or a banking system 
when at the end of the day, the actual coin that you have, you can't build anything or do anything on top of it. This is where smart contracts come into play. And when you understand the architecture that makes up the internet, then you can start understanding a multi-layered architecture with Ethereum, Polkadot, Cardano, Tezos, Avalanche, Solana. I don't care which platform you think is going to be successful. Whoever captures that market will flip Bitcoin because I, I say this all the time. When you understand the internet and you go back to ARPANET, right? The internet was really just simply a means of communication, right? The internet's just a bunch of fiber optic cables spread all throughout the actual, the globe, right? It is these big cables that go underneath the ocean. And then you have data centers and companies that basically plug into that physical layer. And then a bunch of wires that come up to your house that plug into the back of your modem and your router, the, all of that's the internet. When you're browsing, that's the World Wide Web. And then there's a bunch of protocols that talks to each other that facilitates what's going on, whether it's HTTP or whether it's SMTP. You have a chance now with Ethereum, Cardano, uh, Polkadot to invest in the base layer, the actual physical layer, the internet. And then you have to think of it like Legos, where you're stacking a bunch of protocols on top of each other. So when you see a chain link or you see a loop ring or you see a Uniswap or you see a synthetics being built on top of Ethereum, that's effectively what the quote unquote internet you think is that's happening, right? So you have to make sure that you're paying attention to these things when you're getting involved and understand that Bitcoin is just the tip of the iceberg. This technology goes much bigger and deeper than just Bitcoin. Think about identity on a blockchain. Think about voting on a blockchain. So many more important things that you can actually put into, you know, put onto a blockchain or put onto a ledger besides just, you know, a store of value. But again, people are not going to tell you that. And it would be embarrassing and laughable for you to be in the internet back in 1992, 1995, and the only company you ever heard about was IBM, right? There are so many other companies that came out of the dot-com bubble that went on to be Fortune 500 companies all extremely disruptive. And that's what you have here right now. But you have the Bitcoin Max. He's telling you everything's a shit coin, but Bitcoin. And that's just idiotic. And now when you start seeing how these people treat real things like this, you have to start looking at it and saying to yourself, you know, this is 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 important. And someone just talked about Web3. Yes, Web3.0, right? Because when you look at Web1.0, all you could effectively do is read static web pages. And then with the Web 2.0, you can read and write. This is you writing to a page when you're creating a profile and you have videos and you're sharing things, right? And now what happened is that these tech companies, they were able to centralize and conquer the Web 2.0, sort of like the European did when they came to the West, right? Over here to the Americas. What happened was, you know, the Facebooks, the Amazons, the Netflix, the Googles, they basically consolidated power where they basically control the entire flow of web traffic and information and data. The whole purpose of Web 3.0 is creating technology where we can get rid of a lot of that centralization and censorship and ownership that's happening with the internet because the internet isn't functioning the way that it was designed to properly function. When you have Twitter, they can literally kick your president of the United States off of their platform. They can shadow ban you. Right. Where they can basically say, well, we don't like your speech or, you know, you don't believe that a man can wake up in the morning and be a woman. Therefore, we're going to shadow ban you. That's problematic. When you look at the fact that what Facebook did with Cambridge Analytica and your data, all of these things matter because the Internet was designed to be decentralized. But again, as I said before, corporations were able to centralize the Internet. And now you have this like. Facebook and, and Amazon and Google, they're basically monopolies and they consolidate power and they lock out competition, right? So all of these are things that you uh, need to keep in mind. So people keep saying Bitcoin's not scalable, Ether's not scalable. Y guess what? The internet when it was first created or the World Wide Web wasn't scalable either. When you look at your first phone, the first phone was the size of a brick and you had to pay per minute. But technology is designed to iterate and get better over time. If you looked at the first cell phone the size of a brick, you could never imagine that your phone would one day be this small. Your phone would be your bank. Your phone would be your camera. Your phone would be your GPS. Your phone would order your groceries. 
right? There's steps along the way, right? So if you just stopped and said, oh my God, look how big a phone is back in the 90s, then you missed everything along the way. But the problem is that many of you, again, you're deceptive, you're trolls, and you're out here just trying to pump your bags and you don't really understand the implications of the technology. Guess what? Cardano can't scale either. All of these smart contract platforms are just load balancers. They're going to get the spillover from Ethereum. That's the reality. Notice that when the Binance smart chain, they copied the Ethereum virtual machine. They didn't copy the garbage that Cardano's putting together. It's a reason why, right? If if what Charles was putting together was so robust and so needed, why why didn't the Binance Smart Chain copy Cardano's blueprint? Why did they copy the Ethereum virtual machine? I know why. Because the Ethereum virtual machine has utility, it has value. It has billions of dollars locked into it. It has tooling, it has branding. Guess what? Blockchain developers aren't walking around the street left and right. It's, it's a very limited pool of blockchain developers. It's very hard to find and teach blockchain developers. So if all of the developers or the smart people are on the Ethereum ecosystem, where, where's Cardano going to find all of these smart people to build these applications? Oh, or are they going to copy the Uniswap version uh, and, and bring it over to um, Cardano? Because that's what Avalanche just did with Pangolin or Pangolin, however you say it, come on, at a certain point, just know, know that Ethereum, it's Ethereum's game to lose. It's Ethereum's game to lose. Yeah, Cardano's been an unfinished project for a long time. Many of you are new. I've been around this for nine years now. Remember, Shelly was supposed to launch years ago. Keep these things in mind when, when you have people selling you things, right? It's a reason why Ethereum is expensive because it's in demand. There's demand for block space. Markets operate off of supply and demand. That's the, that's the difference. The fees are high. You know why the fees are high? Because there's a lot of demand for the product. There's a lot of demand for the block space. You know why Cardano is cheap? Because no one's using it. Well, March 1st, we're going to see. It's a reason why these other blockchains are cheap because there's no utility as of today. No one's using it. No one's building anything. You know why Tezos never pumped? Because no developers went over there and built anything of magnitude. Keep these things in mind. Not saying that Cardano's a bad investment. Not saying that it won't pump. Everything will pump. Dogecoin pumped 2,000%. Keep these things in mind. Dogecoin pump 2000%. Right? So if, if all you care about is pump, you're going to, you, you can find pumps everywhere. Dogecoin for the year is up 2000%. So is Dogecoin better than, is, is Dogecoin better than Cardano? Cause it's up 2000%. See, there's a difference between price, price going up and utility how much value is locked in DeFi products right so let's let's come here because I, I i know i'm getting distracted from the tether stuff but so what right let's let's look at DeFi pulse there's 37 billion dollars that's economic energy locked into DeFi smart contracts look at this list maker on ethereum ave on ethereum Compound on Ethereum, Curve on Ethereum, Uniswap on Ethereum, Synthetics on Ethereum, Badger, Ethereum, Balancer, Ethereum. Where, where, where are all these other smart contract platforms? Where are they at? Yeah, the Lightning Network, <laughs> they they have $55 million, right? The Bitcoin Maxis, they have 55. There were, there's more Bitcoin sitting on top of the Ethereum network than sitting inside of Lightning.
Come on. Come on, man. You just you, you who do you listen to, right? Now again, everything's going to pump. We're extremely early. So I'm not telling you to sell your bags. What I'm telling you is is that know what you're buying and why you're buying it. Everyone thinks that they can box with Mike Tyson until they get in the ring and have to box with him. Everyone thinks that they can play with LeBron James and then they're, they're watching the game and they're saying, I would have did this, I would have did that. Until LeBron James has 6'8", 250 pounds, is coming at you full speed on a, a fast break and he throws it on top of your head. Right? So everyone, has, everyone, right, all of these small contract platforms, yeah, they're all fast, they're all robust until people start using them and their blocks fill up. That's right, right? So of course you can be fast. You could be scalable when no one's using your blockchain. Keep these things in mind. Again, I don't care if it's, you know, Elrond, if it's Solana, Cosmos, whatever it is, just know that a lot of this technology is early. They have to go through a lot of different iterations. We don't know which one will win, right? I'm banking on ETH and Polkadot. Right. Because my backup plan is that, well, if Ethereum fails, Polkadot's going to be a bridge to all blockchains and interoperability will win. That's my philosophy. Right. Now, your philosophy may be, well, you know, I'm buying Cardano because I believe in what Charles is telling me. Right. So you're going against crypto. You're going against the nature. You're trusting in a human, in a person. You're trusting that Charles is telling you the truth. You're trusting that uh, uh, that Cardano is going to be able to do that. I don't trust. I verify, and I can verify that ETH is in demand. I can verify that ETH has thirty-seven billion dollars locked into it. Right. So just keep these things in mind. Now, where was I? I got a little distracted. Sorry about that. Um. So here we go. It says on February twenty-third. Attorney General James, after a two-year legal battle, decides to settle the lawsuit with Tether and Bitfinex for $18.5 million. In the statement released, the New York Attorney General, uh, released from the New York Attorney General, they confirmed that Tether is indeed a massive fraudulent scam. So, it says, Bitfinex and Tether must submit to mandatory reporting on efforts to stop New York trading. Bitfinex and Tether deceived clients and market in the market by overstating reserves, hiding approximately $850 million in losses around the globe. Well, let's go to the next image right here. In the case of Tether, the company represented that each of its stable coins were backed one-to-one -one by U.S. dollars and reserves. However, an investigation by the Office of the Attorney General, the OAG, found that iFinex, the operator of Bitfinex and Tether, made false statements about the backing of Tether stablecoins and about the movement of hundreds of millions of dollars between the two companies to cover up the truth about massive losses. And when I come here and I look at this right here, I, I come over here and I type in Tether. This guy, uh, Udi or Udi, I don't know how to say his name. Forgive me, right? He's another Bitcoin maxi. Have fun staying pegged, Tether truthers, right? Um, ignore the crypto media pro Tether hype. Read the settlement. It's very readable in particular. The things at the end Tether have to do, all normal stuff for non-crooks, and all stuff have failed hard for four years. So these are basically people saying that this is a non-event. Let's look at some other people. Uh, who else? Let's see some other Bitcoin Maxi, what they have to say. Let's go, because it was a day ago. Yeah, this guy right here. Now shut up about Tether. Let's move on. 18.5 million is nothing, and they admit it to no wrongdoing. Pure FUD after years of speculation. Right. Look, look how many followers this person has. Right. So this person has two hundred and thirty two thousand subs. And he's telling you that this is a non-event, even though now we know for a fact from the lawyer signing the affidavit.
that Tether is not backed one by one to one. We know that the lawyer signed that Tether's lawyer signed an affidavit. But they'll tell you, I don't worry about this. Because all they care about is their price going up. Another Bitcoin maxi. Just read the full AG report on Tether. Highly recommend you do the same to understand the situation. My takeaway, corrupt banking system fucking over crypto companies, pushing them to being unbanked and relying on fringe services is bad. This, 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 this is Bitcoin maxis. Here go Dan Held. Where are all the Tether Fudsters now? <laughs> right? Tether truthers in absolute shambles. Read the report. I'll read this one more time before we get to some more positive things. I don't want to be too negative. Uh, because of Tether's inability to conduct significant banking activity during the time, it could not itself hold sufficient, hold dollars sufficient to back the hundreds of millions of new Tethers that had entered the market until September 15, 2017. The only U.S. dollars held by Tether ostensibly backing the approximately 442 million Tethers in circulation was approximately $61 million deposit at the, deposited at the Bank of Montreal. Right? So I, I'm just, I'm sharing this with you so you can understand. Don't trust anyone in crypto. The whole purpose of crypto is to verify. And I will tell you that many of these people um, behind the scenes, they have partnerships that are conflicts of interest. And um, they are being, they are promoting a lot of things that may put money in their pocket, but aren't beneficial to you. And this goes back to the BlockFi thing I was telling you about, because now we start talking about rehypothecation. So, for example, um, you know, I own a lot of silver. I don't know where my gold is at. I own silver. I don't know where my gold coin is at. But it's the reason why silver and gold always fail this money. Because what would happen here? Go right here. I'm just throwing gold. This is a one ounce American Buffalo. It's a reason why gold always failed as money because you had to trust that the goldsmith would not issue more paper claims on gold than gold that he actually had. And what's going to happen with crypto is if you allow PayPal and you allow Visa and you allow BlockFi to come into the space, they're going to pay you interest. They're going to pay you in fiat. But how do you know that they actually have Bitcoin on hand, right? See, these are things that you have to um, keep in mind when you are listening to people. Because, again, we don't know how much Bitcoin BlockFi actually has. We don't know if BlockFi, if they get hacked, if your Bitcoin goes missing and they're going to pay you back in what fiat dollars. We don't know how much Bitcoin or Ethereum Coinbase actually even has. These are things that you have to keep in mind. So be very careful about rehypothecation, about people basically, because we found this out about GameStop that they were short 140% of the float. There was more short interest in the actual float than actual shares outstanding. So we know for a fact that there's some real shady things that happens on the back end in the traditional financial world. And the whole purpose of crypto was to get rid of these things. So just be very mindful of when you're using these centralized entities, centralized exchanges, because again, there's a lot of money at stake and you have to be careful with who and what you listen to. Now let's get to some positive stuff. Um, I, I would encourage a lot of you to go read these articles too. I don't want to spend too much time on that. Um, just keep these things in mind. Because I know a lot of times when, when you're watching my videos, you can't understand why I feel this way. But here we go. Square buys $170 million worth of Bitcoin. Let's actually listen to the video. This is Kathy Wood. I don't want to do that. This has been a week where Bitcoin's volatility. This payment system. Of course, I do want to start with Bitcoin. That was a big announcement uh, after earnings yesterday. Square's adding about $170 million worth of crypto to its balance sheet. We all know Jack Dorsey was really an early Bitcoin believer, but I'd love to know your thinking behind increasing Square's exposure to crypto, especially from sort of a risk management perspective. This has been a week where Bitcoin's volatility uh, has been on display. 
Well, we feel that Bitcoin is aligned with our purpose, which is economic empowerment. Economic empowerment is about bringing access to financial tools more broadly, including to people who haven't had it before. And we think Bitcoin is a way that could enable that for the future. This investment, coupled with our earlier investment in Bitcoin, is about 5% of our cash. And when you think about the growth of Bitcoin on our platform, we've been enabling our customers to transact Bitcoin for about three years now. And we've responded to the feedback that we've gotten, and we've seen increased awareness. We had 3 million people transacting Bitcoin, Bitcoin through Cash App in 2020, and 1 million who were new to Bitcoin in January. So we're going to be disciplined in our approach and ultimately customer-led as we see this ecosystem evolve. Got it. I know you called it the, the currency of the internet. Uh, really interesting. We also had a big quarter for Square's Cash App. Uh, monthly active users now 36 million. That was up about 50%. Uh, stock trading has been a big part of that. We have talked a lot about retail trading, especially in sort of the GameStop saga. Uh, there were some analyst notes out that week about Square potentially benefiting from users leaving Robinhood. Um, I wonder what happened sort of on your side during that last week in January. What did you see as far as trading behavior on Square? Sure. Our stock's product through Cash App is really about opening the aperture for trading. We started that with fractional shares and we've added news and other ways for people to make informed decisions, including information about stock trading, educational materials. And what we saw in January was very strong performance. We set new highs for number of customers using our stock trading platform for number of trades and for volumes. And it's increasingly become a front door into Cash App. 15% of those customers in January who are new to our stock trading platform were also new to Cash App. And what we see is that customers who transact using our investing products like Bitcoin and stock trading are more engaged on our platform overall. So it gives us a chance to offer them other products and services like cash card or direct deposit to provide them greater daily utility in their financial services lives. How can Bitcoin be a currency? What is it? I, I wouldn't call it. So uh, a lot to unpack there. Number one, uh, thank you for the donation, Tao Jones. The essence of financial inequity is the license to rehypothecate. The Achilles heel of the, benevol the benevolent state turned tyrannical. And I agree with you 100%. And I said this in videos months ago that I believe that we need the institutions to pump our backs because we were for the first time we actually beat Wall Street. But I fear that when they get involved, they're going to create mechanisms to co-opt the movement. And I see a lot of people selling out for the green dollar. And listen, I can't knock them. There's a lot of money at stake here. Um, and we're going through the Great Reset, right? We're going through the Fourth Industrial Revolution. And the future is either going to be a centralized future or it's going to be a decentralized future. If the future is centralized, we are going to be vertically integrated from top to bottom where everything will be tracked, traced, and monitored. I mean, we're already, everything we're doing already right now is basically tracked and traced via our phones. You know, you hear people talk about the microchip that you already have the microchip, right? You walk around with it every day. You love the microchip. You take pictures with your microchip. Many of you sleep with the microchip. You spend hours on your phone browsing with the microchip. Um, it's just not in your body, right? But you love it nonetheless. And um, this phone tracks, traces, and monitors everything you do. When you're speaking and talking about things, you start seeing ads about it. Um, and then this starts getting into predictive programming because what a lot of you don't understand is that th this phone is leading you somewhere, right? Like when you open up your apps, you, it shows you more of what you want to see or what they think you want to see. So your phone starts basically controlling your thoughts, the way you see the world, the way you believe, the way that you think. And the the machine learning, the way that the, the algorithms are structured is that it's designed to keep you engaged on the app as long as possible and then to lead you somewhere. And you have to ask yourself, where is these uh, this technology leading you to? And when we start thinking about centralization, you have to start thinking about China and the social credit score and the fact that you're going to have a central bank digital currency and have a ledger. And we're going to a cashless society. So everything being digital, everything being tracked, traced and monitored. If you say something that they do not like, 
if you don't go along with groupthink, then they lock you out the system. So all of these things are going to be important if the future is centralized, because then it's a pretty bleak future where everything is basically controlled and influenced upon you. Um, if we have a decentralized future, not saying everything will be perfect, but we will have a lot more, a little bit more control and say as to what we do and, and how things are, um, you know, influenced upon you. Like even the whole idea and the, the, the term influencer, right? What are they influencing you to do? What are they influencing you to think? Like these are all things that you have to make sure that you're paying attention to. See, you, you no longer can just spin this as a, a conspiracy theory, right? This is factual information. Um, and when, when you understand these things, you, you have a better understanding as to why this technology is more important than just a ledger, right? Like transparency, accountability matters. Um, one of the biggest, one of my favorite shows is, uh, Westworld. And when they go to the next level of Westworld, and I know you probably say, so what does all this have to do with crypto? Well, we're, we're literally writing the future as we speak, you know, and, and so many of you, you know, you're, you're, you're looking at this as just an opportunity to make money, but you don't understand that this is going to shape the future and, and what the future will look like. Um, there's the, there's the, the artificial intelligence for Hobum inside of the show Westworld. That's one of my favorite shows. And the, the algorithm with Rehoboam literally picks and chooses what your outcome would be for your life. Like you have no control over your life. The machine already has predetermined whether or not you're going to be a factory worker, whether or not you're going to be wealthy, whether or not you're going to be rich. And as I said before, you know, when you're on YouTube, wh why do you think they show you certain things on your homepage? Right? What, what, who, de who determines that that's what you want to see? Right? All of these things matter because you have to start asking yourself, are you in control of your thoughts and feelings or is the machine right, controlling these things? Even if you go back to the movie, The Matrix, right? the, the whole idea of a red pill and blue pill, they, they were just still two forms of control. So when you start thinking on a higher level and vibrating on a higher level, you start to understand that there, there's always going to be some form of control. The question just is a matter of how much control. Like even the idea of Zion fighting a war that they could not win because the machines had already won the war. Like, that all of these things matter because we're literally living through the matrix as we speak. And if you can understand these things, you can start thinking on, on a much deeper level. Because when Neo went to meet the architect, the architect told him that we had already destroyed Zion five times, that this would be the sixth time. And I'm saying this to you that like you have a chance right now with decentralization to get back some control, to get back some say, and 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 try to beat the powers that be. Or, you know, you could go the centralization route and we see what centralization got us, right? Wealth inequality is as high as it's ever been right now. Um, you know, if you look at just uh, what's happening right now with the pandemic, how the rich is getting richer, um, you know, literacy rates are going down. So many things are bleak right now and if we continue to allow the powers that be to stay in power then that's what's going to happen this is why centralization is is um so uh, decentralization is so important i saw a donation come through earlier too thank you abraham isaac um i forgot I, let me get to the other person he says um iceman vam says are you worried about zeus capital trying to take down chain link no um see you you have to understand that there are games being played within the game so a lot of times cryptocurrencies will actually fund the FUD campaigns. So, you know, there's some rumors going around that Zeus Capital is actually chain link. You have to keep these things in mind, right? Because if I can control the rumors, the negative rumors, then I can control whether or not a real negative rumor might be out. Um, chain link is going to be valuable no matter what Zeus Capital says, because it's the only right now bridge and you have to look at the teams between the real world and data in the blockchain world so oracles will always be important very very important and it's funny we're talking about the matrix because the oracle paid a played a pivotal role in the matrix as well because she was actually the villain but that's for a whole nother video but um when you understand these things you can understand things on a deeper level why Chainlink is so important. 
And then when you look at the team and the individuals that's put together and Sergey, you I, I like to I, I like to bank on smart people, right? I don't like to bank on um, you know, stupid people. When you look at the team of at Band Protocol, for example, compare the team from Band Protocol, which is another Oracle, to the team at Chainlink. Look at the pedigree of the people. Look at look at the things they've built and worked on. Why do you think I'm so bullish on Polkadot? Because the Ethereum virtual machine spec, you know who built that? Gavin Wood built that. The um built out the spec. You know who built the programming language for Solidity? That was Gavin Wood, who eventually left Ethereum for Polkadot, right? So if 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 a person can build those amazing things and Ethereum's the number two cryptocurrency, that's someone that I want to bank on and put my money behind, right? So this is why I'm so big on the polka dot project and why I want to put money into it. So when I look at Zeus Capital, I look at it as controlled opposition. I don't look at them as releasing any information that's going to really disrupt Chainlink. Right now, the problem with Chainlink is just a lot of the founders are selling. That's the developers are selling. I mean, not the founders. You have a lot of developers selling because prices are high. Um, I predicted that we're going to have a pullback. I still believe that. I believe that we're going to get Bitcoin down to about anywhere from forty-four to thirty-eight thousand dollars. I told you my kill zone for Ethereum is between fifteen hundred and eleven hundred. I still stand by that. Um, we got ETH got down to about thirteen sixty on Coinbase, so that's more or less where I was looking to allocate capital. Um, I cashed out a lot of my altcoins because in some of these projects, I was up 20x. So um, as I share with my members in the group, I'm not going to share with you what I, I started investing in. That's only for members. But I started rotating some money into some new projects. Um, and my philosophy is now I'm looking for projects sub $200 million. Right. So anything below $200 million is what I'm looking to put money into. I'll announce this to the public maybe at a later date. But I start telling the members in the group, what I'm starting to put money towards and what my thinking is. Um, and that's where we at. So, but um, I, I think the market needs a little bit of a pullback. That's healthy. I think the bull market is still intact, but just, I share this tether information with you because you have to be very mindful of who you listen to. Um, and I would, I would go as far as saying, don't listen to anyone verify things. I knew tether wasn't never, wasn't, wasn't backed. I did a video telling you that that's the only thing that keeps me up at night. Um, but what we do know is that our system is corrupt and it's a pay to play system. So like even Ripple, Ripple is a piece of, uh, let me not let me use my, be, let me be friendly with my words. Ripple is garbage, but they're probably going to work out something with the SEC and eventually settling as well. Because at the end of the day, humans can be bought and paid for, right? There's no integrity with most people, but that could take two years, right? So where do you want your money at at the end of the day is what you have to think about. But I still stand by what I said. Ripple is garbage. And you also thank you for the donation. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, uh, Israel. I saw another donation come through. Where did it go? Um, I saw $10 donate. Oh, I guess I missed it. That was five. Oh, there's another one I missed. Um, up here. Did you donate twice, Iceman? This is all you worried about, Zeus Capital. Yeah, Zeus Capital. And and Zeus Capital got liquidated on a margin call. Um, Iceman. Ripple is absolute garbage. Absolute garbage. Take some more questions. Um you know the funny thing? I had a chance to get in. I had a chance to get in Voyager early. A guy by the name of Jesse, he was sharing it with me when I was on Clubhouse, and I didn't take advantage of the opportunity. Um, I haven't really looked at uh, Clubhouse. I'm at Clubhouse. I haven't really looked at um, the Voyager technology. Um, I'm assuming it's an exchange. Um, I haven't looked at it. I know it's a stock as well, but I haven't. I haven't looked at it. I had a chance to get into it though. He told me about it. I just missed out on it. V Chain's a solid project, Thaddeus. That I made a I made a lot of money. V Chain was by far one of my biggest winners. Um,
right? By by far, V Chain was one of my biggest winners. Um, I made a big bag on V Chain. Um, v Chain's a solid project. I made a lot of money in Matic. Look at the Graph Token. Graph Token bounce. Remember, remember the other day, right? When I said I was getting off the stream, and the Graph Token was at like a dollar sixty one, I think a dollar sixty nine. So gra the Graph Token is one of my favorite projects. Still ticking. I took profit on it, but buy back in. Yeah, one hundred percent, Mister G. The uh, chain link is chain link by far is is light years ahead of any Oracle solution. Light years ahead. Um, not even just with tech, but just integration, the network effect. Because and Michael Silla said this. We're gonna get to Kathy Wood too in a second. Twitter is the dominant speech network. Facebook is the dominant social network. YouTube is the dominant content network in terms of video content. And when you start understanding that Instagram's the dominant picture network, once a particular entity captures that network, it's mainly winner takes all. You may have a few people on the outside that, you know, can make a fight. Like think about search engines. There are other search engines. You have Bing, you have Yahoo, but Google dominates that space because people just go, it has the branding, Google it. So when you understand that whoever, whoever captures that market first, it's very hard to catch up to the, the winner. You can catch up over time, but it's going to be very hard. Like look at Apple, look how dominant Apple is, not just as a retailer, but also as a technology company, as a data company, um, as a wearables company, because they, they had such a, a just a, a massive head start in the, you know, the smartphone market. So Android may have more devices because, you know, Android would make any piece of garbage. Um, but as far as that premium luxury market, Apple dominates that market. Right. And then they then they're able to create this ecosystem where, you know, you have a laptop, you have a watch, you have a phone, you have an iPad. Right. Then you have the iPods. Then you have the speaker like you create a, a whole system because you were able to dominate one particular niche. And then it just goes on and on so whoever captures that market first dominates and chain link has that so by far chain link is light years ahead of any any of these other oracles yeah v, v chain is v chain is big because they have a lot of real world partnerships real world utility i was telling people in the group that you know v chain's a project that i can see being around three to five years from now you know, if you go back to when I first got involved in crypto and you start looking at a lot of these, look at the top 50 or the top 100. Many of these projects are nowhere to be found, right? I was talking about EOS earlier today. Uh, where is EOS trading at right now? Um, right, it's it's worth $3 billion right now. EOS was supposed to be the Ethereum killer. Dan Laramere, he just, you know, he knew so much. He was such a smart guy. This is the same guy that left Steam it, left BitShares, you know, Serial Project Jumper, Project Hopper. I, I laugh at these things, right? Because all of these Ethereum killers, they never kill Ethereum. <laughs> you know, I've been hearing about these Ethereum killers for, for so long now. It's just, it's, it's laughable. Instead of just focusing on just building, you know, building solid projects. Right. Build, build some utility, build some use cases. And again, I'm not saying that Cardano can't do it. Maybe they can. Maybe they can't. I, I just know I've been in ETH since forty dollars. I've made a ton of money. Um, I understand the ecosystem. I've actually used the technology, developed with the technology. I know what it can do, what it can't do. Um, I, you know, and I, I don't see I don't see any serious developers leaving Ethereum for Cardano. I don't see it. When I when I see People from synthetics or Ave, you know, talking about going over to Cardano, then I'll start taking Cardano serious. But if they're just copying ETH projects, nah, whatever. Yeah, John P. Blackberry and Nokia underestimated Apple 100%. Look, look what Blockbuster did with Netflix. Most people always underestimate the, the technology that's disruptive.
<laughs> um, Eli, would you risk 1K on Hex? And why haven't you taken Nagabo's financial command? <laughs> we gotta play my man Nagabo. Nagabo is funny. Um, I had a chance to get into Hex. I just I was iffy about it at first, you know, um, because it's just it's so many schemes in crypto. But um, I just I, I missed out on it. One thing about me, I don't chase pumps, so if I miss out on something, I just miss out on it. Um, I don't really have trading strategies, um, Mr. Rosborn, um, but the Academy link is in the description below, right? I just mainly tell you guys what I'm buying, uh, like what prices and stuff that um, I would be looking to add. Um, I mainly cover like the technology. Um, I started a coding bootcamp, then I, I ended, I didn't end it, but I just left it, paused it. Um, I'm re I'm re in the process of redoing it. It's already finished. It's mad just people testing it out. And I really want to focus on like building the technology and stuff like that. That's what we're going to be doing in the academy. So I mainly just focus, excuse me, on the education of the, what this technology can do um, and just building a community. Uh, there are some people in the academy that trade and they talk about trades that they've taken. Like I know Mr. G said he shorted Ethereum, um, stuff like that. But I'm not really big into trading cryptocurrencies like that because i just i i know that for most of you you're gonna you're going to probably lose money so um, i'm iffy with that but again uh, that's the link to join the academy we have a free three-day trial so you're welcome to test it out if you like it you can stick around if not um you don't have to <laughs> bringing you some more of this crypto naga magic don't worry guys we're going to listen to some naga bow in a second um have you looked at a new cipher? No. Um, this weekend, remember, I did the poll for Zillica and Theta. So we're going to do the review of Zillica and, and Theta because a lot of you guys donated um, and you asked me about those projects. So that's what I will be covering this weekend, both Zillica and Theta, um, doing a deep dive on a project, looking at the team and stuff like that, because um, a lot of you are obviously invested in the project. So that's what we'll be doing that. We're probably going to do that on Saturday. Because on Sunday, I'm going to have another community meeting to address some more questions for those of you who are paying members of the Academy. Um, diving deep in that. So, because I know there, there's just been so many questions. Because I've been busy putting together a lot of content and courses. Like how to, for example, like I'm working on how to find good projects, the tools that I use and things of that nature. So just putting together some good stuff for you. I had to stop the DeFi course because the fees are just too high and I'm not going to um I'm not going to promote something to you guys that right now you just can't take advantage of. That wouldn't make any sense. Um I'm not going to do that. Um Oh, uh, let's get to Kathy Wood cuz she she was talking about a uh, Bitcoin you know I love Kathy Wood. I think she's extremely brilliant. One of the bro one of the better minds, you know, in finance in general. Uh, what, what are you thinking? We just got notice that that Square about one hundred and seventy million dollars worth of Bitcoin in the most recent quarter. Um, thoughts on Bitcoin? Yes. Yeah. Yes, uh, we're very positive on Bitcoin. Again, very happy to see a healthy correction here. Uh, no market is straight up. Everyone should know that. Everyone should have some dry powder for, for days like these. And, and I've been saying that for a while. Uh, we see so many use cases of, uh, of Bitcoin, but yeah. probably the, the most important use case is an insurance policy around the world against confiscation of wealth. And that can happen in two ways. It can happen with inflation. Bitcoin, I think, is the best hedge against inflation. Mm out there, bar none, uh, better than gold. And uh, and it can happen outright. I mean, when you saw in the Middle East a uh, uh, prince uh, take or seize his own relative's wealth, right. uh, you know, everyone should know, if you think there's a 5% chance of that happening, you should put 5% of your portfolio long-term into, or your wealth, into something like Bitcoin. 
You hey, can carry the keys in your head across the border. Right. You think about, right, in terms of what that, that allows you. Hey, your big ideas for 2021, we've been talking about it a lot off air ourselves, 112 pages. It's on the website. What are the big ideas, Kathy, that we need to be thinking about for 2021? Well, the new ideas, uh, you know, big ideas are not just a one idea. So we've uh, we've updated our, our deep learning, digital wallets, Bitcoin, uh, EV ride hailing, some of the things with our drone work, uh, our sequencing, long read sequencing. Our new uh, uh, our new uh, sections are called uh, reinventing the data center. We mm. think Intel is going to lose uh, is going to lose most of its share in the data center, and that's its most profitable uh, uh, division. Uh, virtual worlds, so gaming uh, uh, and sports uh, gambling. Uh, gaming uh, becoming, uh, moving away from just the pure gaming world, but with platforms like uh, Unity and uh, Unreal Networks like Epic, uh, we're going to be bringing uh, virtual worlds into everyday business. Of course, virtual reality, augmented reality. Yeah, you know, um, she has an ETF too. The ETF is doing pretty well. Um Kathy is by far one of the brightest minds in the brighter minds. She understands technology and just how disruptive it is. And as I said before, um, Bitcoin is going to do extremely well as a store of value. And then whoever captures the smart contract platform, whether it's Cardano, Tezos, Avalanche, Solana, whatever the case may be, I believe it's going to be ETH. Um, they will eventually over the next three to five years flip Bitcoin is my my personal belief and um, my opinion. Uh, there was a question that came through. Um, a lot of you keep talking about the fees on Ethereum. I, I also, you know me, I'm a straight shooter. EIP-1559 does not fix the fee problem with ETH. Um, because effectively what EIP-1559 does is it just sets a base fee. And then that fee will increment or decrement based upon how much capacity is coming through, right? So again, remember... A block has a certain amount of transactions that it could fit. So let's say that the three previous blocks basically hit 50% of the gas limit. So the gas limit right now is 12 and a half million guay. So once once you get to 50% of the capacity, what they're going to do is they're going to start ratcheting up the base fee, right? So again, if fees are high because of congestion, Right. What they're going to do is increase the gas limit. So going from twelve and a half million guay to twenty five million. The, the, the problem with that is that it's just going to steer step the fee. So right now you get these crazy spikes in fees. Right. So like, for example, you know, this fee may be two hundred dollars on this block and then the next block may be one hundred dollars. So effectively, what EIP fifteen fifty nine is going to do is just literally create a stair step for fees. But again, if the network's congested. And, you know, people are hitting the upper ends of the threshold of the, of the gas limit. You're still going to have high fees. It doesn't change anything. Right. So the bottom line is you need to have multiple chains processing different transactions. Um, and, and that's what, you know, Gavin Wood was speaking about. And I totally agree with that, with the whole idea of sharding the, the, the blockchain. That's where you're going to basically be able to bring the fees down, in my opinion. Um, you know, based upon the studies that I've looked at, EIP 1559 doesn't do anything to bring down the fees. It just basically controls them where they do not spike crazy. Like they don't have these crazy spikes, but it doesn't do anything. You know, um, Ethereum does a really, really good job of basically stringing you along. Remember, ETH 2.0 was supposed to be launching three years ago. So. Um, and that's crypto in general. I, as I said before, I've been around the Cardano's the same way. These people promise you, promise you, promise you, promise you and string you along. Because what you have to understand about technology is that the longer you can have an unfinished product, the more money that you're going to get. Right. And if you can keep moving the goalposts and never have a finished product, then you'll 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 basically you can keep getting new money and new investors. Right. That's if you if you know the tech con. And and you see this happen in most technology companies is that like they keep they it's always about what's next, right? So just keep these things in mind. Um well from uh Adam 
Baptiste, most of the people who invested with me when I when I first started opening up my investment, I had to shut it down because I'm not um I'm not a licensed investor and I'm not a fund manager. So, you know, a lot of people were trying to hate on me because I get a lot of haters. Um, but like we're up almost four hundred percent right now for the people who invested with me back when I was first started the investment thing I was doing. We're up almost four what, what, about four hundred and seven percent, four hundred and fifteen percent. Not even counting like the liquidity mining, like there's just so many, so many different ways of making money, you know, um, turning 10, turning 10 K into hundred K is not Harvard crypto. It's just not because we're early, right? It's, it's not even a function of me being a genius. It's just a function of timing right now. Obviously I know when to go in and when to go out, but like we're doing extremely well. And it's only going to be better because now you have money to play with, right? So now you could take. Now you can start going for, you know, like some real risky things that if they pay up, and that's what that's what I'm doing now. Like I was telling the members in our community meeting, um, you know, I'm gonna be a little bit more risky now with the things that I'm investing in, where, you know, I'm going to invest in a whole bunch of different things. I only need one of them to 10x or you know 20x, and it'll make up for the the other losses. So, nah, nah, not like Umar Johnson, baby. Um, I have contracts in place, um, audits in place. I do I do legitimate business. No hotel hustle over here. Um, I believe in transparency. Though when when you take someone's money, um, you need to be transparent with them. You need to update them as to what's going on. Um, I'm not going to put you in a WhatsApp group. You and I will get together. We will do Zoom meetings. You'll be able to see what I'm doing and where I'm at. That's how I do business. I don't do. I don't do the hotel hustle, right? I'm not talking about the ancestors and running around at grave sites. That's just not how business is conducted at all. Um, you know, people need to see ledgers. There needs to be a paper trail as to where the money went to, what time the money got there. There needs to be, you know, your signature, my signature, what's going to be the breakdown. Umar Johnson never did any of that with any of the people who donated to the school. So that's problematic. You know, I do, I do legitimate business, um, as, as we should. So those of you who we've, we're doing business together, you can vouch for what I'm, what I got going on. Yeah, I, I could definitely see that coming. Mama or your coin. Um, let's look at some crypto right now. Let's pull up some charts. Look at the 10 year. So the 10 year treasury is still starting to go up. So I, I, I the overall trend with the 10 year treasury is lower. I mean, overall, the the the, the trend for the treasure the ten year treasury is going to be lower. I believe we're, we're going to see negative rates here in the states on government debt. You're going to see the Fed start stepping into, and probably do like some operation twist where they're going to buy treasuries to push the rates down. Uh Um, Eli, I currently have a whole Bitcoin sitting on an exchange, coin top. You've asked this question before after doing some trading, but when I went to withdraw, I got hit with a huge tax bill. Is that normal? I don't know what coin top is, um, but, um, I believe that your, your taxes have to come after you cash out into fiat. So if you never cashed out into fiat, and actually realize the capital gain. I don't understand how you can be taxed unless coin top is like some type of IRA account or something. I don't know about, I've never heard of it, but from my understanding, again, I'm not a tax preparer or a tax professional. Um, but you get taxed on capital on, on realized gains, right? So you would have to realize that gain and actually sell it. So I don't understand how they can just tax you on a withdrawal. Yeah, it's a taxable event, but they don't tax you right then and there, John P. 
<laughs> right? Like, like it, if I swap from USDC to um, ETH, they don't tax me right then and there. Right? Like, like I have to actually, like, you know, cash out and then go file my taxes at the end of the year. I never, I've never heard of an exchange calculating your capital gains taxes for you. I've never heard of that. Uh, maybe you can teach me something I don't know, but I, 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 I've, I, I've never, ever, you know, uh, heard of my life where I, I, I swap from one coin to another and they hit me with my capital gains taxes. I, you know, um, I, I never heard of that. Uh, I have no anything related to Ripple is garbage. It's useless. It's yeah, I wouldn't touch it. Right. So anything, anything with Ripple. It's garbage. The technology cannot do what they say it's doing. It's garbage. There's a reason why no one's partner. All of these partnerships that they've been paying people for, why are not? Why aren't people still using Ripple in the technology? Very simple. If it's so revolutionary, it's so, it's so game changing. They've did all of these partnerships. Who's actually using it? El Cool J, you should know where I'm getting all of these coins from. If you're a part of the academy, right? I show you how I'm getting all of these coins. Yeah, I, I, you've asked that question before with Coin Top. I've never even heard of Coin Top. Don't know about Phantom. That's not not something I looked at. I couldn't tell you about Phantom. Remember, guys, there's over, what, 6,000, 8,000 cryptocurrencies. There's a lot of cryptocurrencies that I just I don't personally know about. I like to focus on, like, you know, winners, guaranteed winners. I try to stay away from a lot of the, you know, obscure coins. Not saying that they can't pump, but I like to just I like to stick with things that, you know, um, that I, I just I feel are more solid projects. Like the synthetics, the aves, the makers, the loop rings, you know, legit things with legit teams. I, I stay away from a lot of the garbage. Now I'm going to I'm going I'm going to look at some of the garbage because I, I just I made so much money. Like literally, I got I've 20 X, I've 10 X, I've 20 X, I've 10 X. So I have a lot of money to play with now. So I have a, I'm going to create like a little, you know, um, altcoin portfolio and I'll go look at some garbage. Because this garbage will pump. But I don't have time for that. Well, we already got a 20% pullback in Bitcoin on Monday. Um, over the next two weeks, I, I believe that we're going to like flatten out. Um, but again, I, like I said, this is crypto. Anything can happen. So you should not be making financial decisions based upon what I'm saying. But I, 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 I just, from me being involved in crypto, there's too much dumb money in crypto right now. Like, I have people telling me that Cardano is better than Ethereum. Think about it, right? Cardano doesn't have one application on their platform that is worth a billion dollars. Yet people are saying that Cardano is Facebook and Ethereum is MySpace. Think about this. And then I, I ask them very simple questions. Have you actually developed anything on a test net? Have you, have you tried to do any of the throughput, right? Have you built anything on any of their test nets, right? So how do you know that they can do all of these transactions, right? Because many of you, you just repeat what Charles is saying. Great. Have you actually tested these things in real life? Have you watched someone like watch a developer build an application, right? Like, so. Let's say you don't have any tech background. Have you watched anyone develop and build an application on their test net? How do you know that they can be so fast? How do you know that they can do all this throughput? How? How do you know? Right? But I have people telling me, I don't know what I'm talking about. Cardano's better than Ethereum. They don't have one, one application built on their platform that does anywhere near the volume that Ethereum applications have. Right. 
He says, "Bow right." He says, "Bow finance in their staking pools, not no staking pool. I'm talking about an application like synthetics, an application like Ave, where you're doing flash loans, where you're borrowing, where you're lending, where you're doing utility. Can you name any of that for me? Just show it to me." That's all, all I want you to do. Just show me that and I'll shut up. Come on, man. Like, listen. And again, I'm not saying that they won't be able to get there. They're not there right now. Like, right. Then I have, then I have people telling me that I'm, I'm, I'm big mad over the Binance smart chain. Right. I'm, 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 I'm jealous over a centralized exchange like Binance literally copying the Ethereum virtual machine. Come on, like you just, uh, you, you 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 know, like it just it 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 amazes me sitting here listening to people just say things like you just you just go wow like this is how I know there's too much money there's too much new money, um right there, there there's too much new money in here when you, when you see people saying stuff like that when I see Dogecoin the fact that Dogecoin is worth and hold on because I know that sometimes this is outdated yeah Dogecoin's worth seven billion dollars. Right? Why? 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 Why would Dogecoin be worth seven billion dollars? Why? Even if even if you think that it could be a currency, you have stable coins, and you have decentralized stable coins like Dai, that's an algorithmic coin, and you have centralized ones like USDC and USDT. So why do you need Dogecoin? It, it makes no sense. It's just too much dumb money. Now again. Remember, there's a difference between something pumping, like a pump and dump, and making money versus utility. So I, I just know that we have to get this 30% pullback. So uh, sorry I got distracted, but we got a 20% pullback already in Bitcoin. As I said before, 44,000 Bitcoin, 38,000. That's why I'll be looking to allocate more capital for Ethereum. 1500 to $1,100 is where I'll be looking to allocate capital. We got down to 1360 with ETH. Um, and then, like I said, I'm rotating into some new projects. Uh, those of you in Academy, you know what I'm talking about. Right. So. Um, I I don't know what Elon Musk is doing with Dogecoin. I'll be honest with you. I, I have no idea. Let's see what he's been tweeting. Um. um uh. I'll see what he's been up to. Because he's been tweeting a lot about Dogecoin. Um, <laughs> Elon Musk is funny. He's he's hilarious. He put this up, I guess, Dogecoin on the moon. Um, let's look at BTC, right? Uh, uh, so let's go crypto. Let's look at some charts, see what's going on. This is not the chart I like to look at. Um, is it the Kraken chart that I like to look at? I hate when my computer restarts. Hmm. Think is this chart? Uh, nah. Whatever. Coinbase isn't bad. We got a weekly. Yeah. Like I said, I'm looking for forty-four thousand to thirty-eight thousand. I don't. I don't ever see Bitcoin getting below thirty thousand dollars, just because there's so much institutional demand for Bitcoin right now. Especially with the Democrats being in control, um, everyone's looking for a way to get involved. Also, the stock market's heavily overheated right now. You just need that pullback. So, my prediction, and this is just one of my predictions, I'm not, I'm never one hundred percent with my predictions, but I'm close, right? So, based upon how the Fed 
calculates inflation. I believe that over the coming quarter, we're going to see a dip in inflation. And then that's going to cause um, markets to go down because everyone's expecting inflation. So let's say second quarter inflation dip. And then third quarter, once everything opens back up, that's when we see the pump in inflation, right? Uh, I believe that Jerome Powell has to come in, um, you know, do his thing, pump the, uh, pump the markets, right? So I just think that we need a correction in the stock market and we need a correction in crypto. And you can either correct with like a down move or you could correct sideways. So I see crypto like going down to like, you know, like when I say crypto, I mean Bitcoin because it's the bellwether, right? So I see Bitcoin fluctuating from like, you know, 45,000, 38,000 doing that for, you know, let's say like about a good four to six weeks. And then boom, we get that next up move is what I, I start to see is what I think is going to happen. Um, so real estate's a tricky one, right? Because for example, like I live here in New York city. That's a good question, Earl. So like in New York city, rents are actually going down and real estate prices are coming down in the city because everyone's fleeing the city and running to the suburbs. So what's happening is that you're getting an inverse. Now you're getting real estate prices in the city coming down, rents coming down in the city, but then prices going up and inventory getting snatched up off the market in the suburbs of New York, like the Westchester area, looking in places like Queens. So um, re real estate is, is like a tricky dynamic because it all depends on, you know, like the location where you're at. And again, it, it, there, there, there isn't a one size fit all solution when you th start talking about real estate because you have to start thinking about, well, how much equity do you have in a property? Is it a multifamily versus single family? You know, um, are you in a position where you have to raise rents? You know, do you have a tenant stuck in it that not, that's not paying you rent? Are you in forbearance right now with these different government programs? So real estate, you have to be very, very, I would say, mindful as to where you're buying and what you're buying. Um, and, and just know that that what, what, what the laws are in terms of evicting people, things of that nature. So because, like, again, like here in New York, if you have a tenant in your property and then they, they, they can prove that they got laid off and they can't work, they, they don't have to pay you. So and the actual um, uh, eviction process has been shut down. You can't evict people. Right. So you just these are things that you have to keep in mind with real estate. So you have to be very picky. Like, for example, Florida is doing really well because they're not really shut down. Uh, parts of like Atlanta, the, the state of Georgia, they're doing well. Um, but then look at a place like Texas, right? They, they were doing okay too. And then boom, the storm comes. So just, I wouldn't say that you have to worry about a real estate crash. You just have to worry about like different externalities that may affect your, you know, what you do and how you do it. Um, like for example, here in New York, like, like, like a lot of those like wholesaling deals and stuff like that. You can never do that here. We're, we're like wholesaling and stuff. It just doesn't work. So it's all about being, being mindful what you're buying. Um, yeah, Pokestart's a good place to get involved in projects. No, see, Joshua, people get inflation wrong, right? So the Fed printing money isn't the inflation, right? The real inflation comes from the banking system because what happens is fractional reserve lending, right? The bank banks can create currency and credit faster than the Fed could ever create inflation. The Fed has always been trying to drive up inflation. They just, they always suck at doing it because they do trickle down economics and most of the money just ends up stuck within the financial system. So when you go to a bank and you sign your name on a dotted line and you get that $300,000 mortgage, you just sprung $300,000 into circulation and that money, you know, flows throughout the system. And this is what creates artificial demand for the dollar, right? So this is how you get this like tug of war back and forth because being that the debt is denominated in the U.S. dollars, you have to work for more U.S. dollars to pay back your mortgage, your car loan, your student loan, et cetera. 
So this is what gives the, the dollar the idea of quote unquote supply and demand. The problem is, is that you go through these boom and bust cycles, right? So when the economy is growing, that's because debt is growing. But then what happens is that the contraction happens. You can't afford to pay back the debt. People start defaulting. So then you get this, this sort of like this, this drain effect where you're like, you're sucking the excess liquidity that you put out there. So the only way you can refate the bubble is you have to create more demand for debt, right? So you have to take on more debt than you did before because you got to take on an equal amount of debt to blow up the, to reflate the bubble and then make it go bigger. So this is how the debt constantly keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. This is the whole battle of inflation deflation. The problem is, is that we're at a point now where these debts are too high, right? Like, like the, the amount of debt, I think in Jeff Booth's book, he was talking about this, like we had to take on 185 a trillion dollars worth of debt in order to get $35 trillion worth of growth, right? So it's to the point where we're taking on more debt and we're getting less growth. So when you start understanding that dynamic where we're at right now, that's where the hyperinflation comes into play because now the Fed's going to start saying, and we're watching this happen right now, that this is where modern monetary theory comes into play. Well, the Fed can just print this money and buy this debt. And that's what we're starting to see now where the Fed's buying treasuries, the Fed's buying toxic assets from the bank's balance sheets, right? Money that shouldn't have even been given away. So this is where now where the hyperinflation comes into play, where the Fed has to start being the, the borrower of last resort and paper over these losses. So the banks are creating the inflation through the debt mechanism and then now the Fed has to come in and eventually say, you know what? Well, the, the American taxpayer, the, the American citizens tapped out, right? Like your credit cards are tapped out. You're getting killed in student loans, killed with, infl with higher asset prices and inflation. Well, let the Fed be the buyer of last resort. So the Fed's buying junk bonds now. The Fed's buying ETFs. The Fed's buying stocks. The Fed's buying treasuries. The Fed will be the last lender and borrower. I mean, the, the last lender of resort and the last buyer of all of this debt. And then that's where the hyperinflation comes. The question now is just when do we go on this path? And I believe now with the Democrats in control, um, Biden's already talking about the $1.9 trillion is just the down payment. And they're also talking about a $3 trillion infrastructure bill, right? So now you have the squad, AOC, Ilhan Omar, um, Rashid Tlaib, uh, Rashida Taleb, or how we say her name, all of these people uh, that makes up the squad and the people like Bernie who believe that, you know, debt and deficits don't matter. Monetary theory is the way, modern monetary theory is the way to go. I believe that we have the perfect storm now to get the, the pressure to go on the Fed to basically crank up the helicopter money. And I think that's when we see the inflation, right? When the Fed goes in the market and just starts buying everything. <clears throat> Um, Elbra, for, I, Elbra, I, I, that's where I'm looking to, um, um, that's where I'm looking to accumulate 1500 to 1100, right? That's my, that's my kill zone. Um, yeah. Red pill finance, student loans as well. Like they're, they're already putting the, they already, they're already telling you, right. Buy a, basically forgive student loan debt up to $50,000, um, $15 mi um, minimum wage, all of these things, right? So universal basic income, because the economy is never going to go back to the, sa the same. This is our 9-11, what we're going through right now, right? Um, this is our 9-11. The, the world will never be the same after this. It will be completely different. So, right. So, but my, my kill zone for ETH is from $1,500 to $1,100. Because you, have, you also have to think about a lot of the margin traders that's going to get liquidated. And once their stops get hit, it creates like that vacuum effect where it sucks the market down real quick. Like on Kraken, ETH crashed to $700, right? Because you have a lot of people who are creating over collateralized loans and things of that nature. So all of them, they have to get liquidated. So I believe that once we get that, that smash down, we're, we're, we're going to real quick pipe, pop down to like 1100 and come back up. Yeah, uh, 
chain chain link was chain link went down on on um Coinbase to twenty one dollars. Mm -hmm. Hello, dumb money here, making small gains in order to afford your course. Just you wait. I'm going to learn DeFi soon. No, listen, Um, if you I, I said this earlier, if you can't afford if you can't afford my course, right, then just watch my free videos. It's, it's, you do not have to join my academy. You do not have to join my courses and things of that nature. Listen, you don't have to. No one's forcing you to free world. You don't have to. <clears throat> There are other places you can go if you want information. Um, one true ice man. Um, he says, Eli, I'm a member of my tech academy. Can you show? Can I show you what I'm talking about? Um, are you still talking about the Zeus Capital thing? I, I saw the ads and everything for Zeus Capital, but yeah, you can show me what you talk what, what you're talking about. Just message me, right? Shoot me a message on the Slack group. I tell you guys when you. Like when you message me and stuff, it comes straight to my phone. This is how I'm able to respond so quick to you guys when you um with Slack, right? Like I get all of the notifications right to my phone. So it's just a text message, right? So we just, you, that's basically what you get when you get into the Slack group. You get to talk to me directly, right? So some of you guys even call me <laughs> on, on Slack. I was shocked. I didn't know you could you could call people, so. Congratulations, uh, Lisa Rowe. You brought Chainlink at three dollars and forty cents. I've been talking about it since it was two dollars. Yeah, Todd Mac, it, it, this is much bigger than that, right? The, the the implications that that this is going to have on a global economy is 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 major. I mean. Big Big Claus already told you you will own nothing and love it. He told you that during the the World Economic Forum. They said it's time for a great reset. The world is moving towards a more socialist agenda. Uh, the 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 idea of capitalism. And again, this is when I'm speaking, right? I'm not here to say whether this is right or wrong. Uh, I you know I don't get caught up in arguing about ideology. I just focus on what can make me money. Um, the world wants socialism. I told you when you see Black Lives Matter posted on the NBA floor and you see so much of corporate America buying into that messaging, that ideology, and literally the people from Black Lives Matter, they're telling you that they're trained Marxist. <laughs> like they're telling you that. Like they're they're not they're they're not hiding what they're doing. See, if you listen to Alex Jones or David Icke, they try to make that, oh, the Bilderberg, the reptilians, they're gonna come from Planet X. No, like these people are bold. They're telling you, like they they want to get rid of the white male, right? They want to get rid of the patriarch society. They want to create this matriarch society. They want to get rid of gender. They don't. They no longer want male or female. They just want you to be fluid. Um, they're telling you what they're going to do. So it's just a matter of whether or not you believe that these people are going to do the things that they say they're going to do. They're saying they want a great reset, right? It's it's here. So if 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 you you know, you don't see it, then I don't know what to tell you. But the world is moving towards a more socialistic, I you know, ideology. Um, but the 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 thing you keep failing to realize is that this socialism is not going to benefit the masses. It's all about consolidating power. Um. So these are these these are things that you have to you know keep in mind when you're you know you're watching what's going on. Nothing happens in a vacuum. All of these things are connected. You just have to be willing to connect the dots. Um, it wasn't that it wasn't that Trump was your last chance. It was that Trump was unpredictable, right? Like it, it's just it's you know it. Trump was unpredictable, so it it was very hard for you to like pin him down. So it, it wasn't that he was good or bad. It's just that he wasn't a part of the the establishment, right? He, good or bad. He just was, you know, he was like a wild man, right? So it just, Trump just bought you some more time, honestly. It bought you some more time to get yourself prepared.
right? So it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if you're Republican or Democrat, right? It's just the right and left wing of the same bird flying towards the same destination, which is the Great Reset. Excuse me, right? So just when, when you understand that, that it's just the right and left wing of the same bird flying towards the same destination, you don't get caught up in arguing Republican versus Democrat because you understand what's going to come. Um, <laughs> Alex Jones looks like he's gonna. Alex Jones is funny sometimes. I like to laugh at him. I like to laugh at Alex Jones. Uh, uh, um, Sheldon Abrams, I'm I'm torn on GRT, right? Because I didn't expect GRT to pump as fast as it did. It, it it pumped literally. I, I told everybody about it when it was like 33 cents in the academy. Where's GRT at? And then, you know, it, it literally, it went to $3 billion quick. Like, boom. So I was just like, damn. Like, it, the, the, it rocketed up so quick. So I had to take profit because that was basically a 10x from 33 cents up to almost $3. Um, but my, my, my market cap for grt was between three and five billion dollars it just i didn't expect it to hit it this quickly um because i i you know based upon their roadmap but again uh, it's a lot of money pouring in the fact that it's available um on coinbase in certain locations it's it's that's big as well too so uh it could it, it could exceed my expectations but i took profit i started buying back in the other day at like the, the dollar 69 and 61 um, so we'll watch it. We'll monitor it. It's one of my favorite projects long term, but you know, just I had to. When you ten extra money, you got to take some profit. Mm -hmm. Uh, VCAP. I covered that for my, my my members in the academy. I have to keep some things secret for the for the members. Um. In the coming weeks, I'll let you know what I've been putting money into. Oh, Sheldon, I said, yeah, Kev. yeah. Um, GRT is it's a solid project. Uh, we're getting a pullback. So that's the beautiful thing about pullbacks; it lets you get into some projects that you you know might have wanted to get into. Um. So, um, if you're if you're a member. Uh, I already started uploading the um, members meeting we had today. It just it takes a while for Kajabi to process it and put it in there. MJ, I, I have n no idea what you're talking about. See, this is this is what's comical. Like when you say, here you go with this rhetoric, no truth in what you're saying. So you're saying that the World Economic Forum didn't happen. Th th this is what this is the, the, the individuals that exist out here, right? Literally, just follow me here, right? Mm, maybe you're being sarcastic, so I'm going to give you the benefit of the doubt. Are you telling me that the World Economic Forum didn't happen? Are you are you telling me that they literally didn't call it the Great Reset? Right? Poli you're 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 talking to me about political education. Really? Are you, are you, so you're telling me that there's no legislation being passed to get rid of male and female bathrooms? <laughs> right? Like, are, are you really going to sit up here and tell me that that legislation doesn't exist, that I'm just baking these things up? Like, y y come on, you, you sound, you sound foolish. You sound stupid. What the, what the hell does Fred Hampton have to do <laughs> with the Great Reset, right? Right? 
right? How is, how is that extreme? How is that extreme? How is that not factual? The NFL canceled, um, the NBA canceled their all-star games because of the Charlotte bathroom ruling. That's a fact. It's a fact. <laughs> what the hell does this have to do with ADOS? <laughs> what, what does a bathroom have to do with ADOS? <laughs> Right? What does what does the bathroom have to do with ADOS? <laughs> Come on. This is crazy. Like, please. That has nothing has nothing to do with ADOS. <laughs> These are factual things, right? Now, it's not for me to tell you, it's for you to prove me wrong. <laughs> The hell does the bathroom ruling have to do with ADOS? Nothing. It just it like, come on, this is foolishness. <laughs> uh, I'm not. I'm not calling Black Lives Matter Marxist. The founder, the founder said, right, that they are trained Marxists. I didn't say this. This is what she said. She said that we are. Trained Marxists. I didn't say this. She said this. <laughs> right? She literally, the, 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 the founder said that they're trained Marxists. <laughs> Come on, man. So what I'm going to do, MJ, is I'll remove you. I'll let you go. To troll heaven, you stuck around long enough. Because I know you're just here to basically create division. So we let you go bye bye. Right? Let you go away. Mm -hmm. So. <laughs> um, like, like, ask yourself, right? And again, this has nothing to do with what you think about race and racism. Where did all of that money go that Black Lives Matter raised? All of this money that Black Lives Matter raised, where did it go? Ask yourself these questions. That's all you got to do. Where, where did all of the money go? The millions of dollars that they raised. Just ask yourself these questions. Not complicated. <laughs> they invest in the ripple. <laughs> I like that. I like that, Chris asked. <laughs> they brought they brought ripple. <laughs> you guys are funny in the chat. <laughs> Oh man. Oh man. <laughs> oh man. And and I know you're saying, well, what does it have to do with crypto? It has everything to do with crypto because you have to be able to see the game within the game. You have to be a three-dimensional thinker. You cannot just be a person just thinking number go up, bag go up. We're here for a reason, right? We're buying these things for a reason. We're investing for a reason. Keep these things in mind. It's all connected. It's all connected. Um, so, uh, Elbra says, what do you do when you, you have a friend who's dead set on XRP? Um, well, what you have to first understand about the XRP situation is that you, you can't be so gung ho on telling people to sell because this garbage could still pump. Well, we, we witnessed the pump and dump, right? So. 
imagine if you were someone that you brought you purchased Ripple at, you bought it at, let's say, 70 cents, and it crashed down to 17, and then they make the pump and dump, and it pops up to 80 cents. Well, that just gives them a chance to get out. So, you know, I wouldn't be so... I wouldn't be so heavy on trying to convince them. You know, you just got to let time sometimes let people let time tell. But again, we're so early that this garbage could pump. They could create another pump and dump group and pump the price of Ripple to a dollar, right? The You have to focus on the long term what's going to happen with XRP. And, you know, like I said before, I predicted Polkadot would flip XRP. That happened. And I predicted that Chainlink would flip XRP. Only nine billion dollars away. So I, you know, if 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 they want to take that risk, go for it. Because if they win this case in the next year or two, it will pump. So I, I wouldn't I wouldn't focus on. I would share the information. Let them know that there's better places to put their money, based upon the opportunity costs. Um, you know, there's you you could have put that money in polka dot and made a ten x. Back at the same time when people were focused on Ripple. Um, GRT could have did a 10 X back when they went down to the 33 cents. So, um, I would show them that there's better opportunities, but you, at the end of the day, listen, people are emotional when it comes to money. And that's what I was saying to you. We need a wipeout. We need to punish the markets. We just, we need to clear out a lot of this dumb money. We need to punish them. Right. And if, if you do, if, if we need to punish some of these people and just wipe them out. Ripple shouldn't be worth twenty billion dollars. It just shouldn't be. Doge shouldn't be worth seven billion. So, even XLM, like I, I, I Bitcoin Cash, you know, Litecoin. I, I did a video on this before, and I was talking to you. Like Litecoin shouldn't be in the top ten. It's no reason why. It's no reason why Litecoin should be in the top ten. Bitcoin Cash shouldn't be in the top ten. XLM shouldn't be up here. Doge shouldn't be here. Um. NIM shouldn't be up here. Like you, th this is why you see Uniswap getting ready to flip them. You see Ave. Um, so Sol just literally came out of nowhere. But again, this is another smart contract platform that's trying to compete with ETH. Um, we shall see. Look at this. This is a two almost two thousand percent. Adam, you know that's one of my favorite projects. Adam's doing really well. Um, EOS shouldn't be up here. It's done. Bitcoin Satoshi Vision garbage. Monero is my favorite, but I don't I don't see Monero gaining in market cap because Monero is more of a transactional um, currency because of the privacy features that it has. Um, so IOTA permission blockchain should not be up here. Tron, they're literally playing paying celebrities. So a lot of these projects just shouldn't be here. Where would XRP people go? I don't know. That's a good question. I, I, you know, I don't know. Like the XRP people are weird people, man. You know, I, first of all, I don't believe most of them are even real. A lot of them are trolls and bots. So you have to keep that in mind. Like even during the Wall Street bets fiasco, when that was going on with with um Robinhood, like some of the comments and stuff that I was getting in my my um chat, I could tell that there were bots. Like even the amount of views I was getting for that stuff. So, um, crypto grill, I agree. I agree that probably the 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 link, I mean the link people, the XRP people will probably go to um Cardano. The same thing as um the uh, Dogecoin people. And the reason why I believe that that they would go to Cardano is because if people don't look at market cap; they only look at price, right? They're not looking at the fact that it's worth thirty billion dollars. They're only looking at the fact that it's a dollar. So I can see like a lot of people who don't know any better pouring into that because people don't look at market cap. They just look at the, they say, oh, I could buy 100, you know, Cardano's uh, people. People even they even refer to crypto as like shares. Um, No, drugs, bunny. Um. I believe I believe that it's a group of people. When we when we think of Satoshi, I believe that it's Hal Finney, Nick Zabo, 
um, Adam Beck, um, and a few other people. I believe it's a group of people who are Satoshi. Um, I believe all of the people that was on that early mailing list with Satoshi, I believe all of them played a part in creating Bitcoin. Because remember, the whole idea of proof of work is based upon Adam um, Beck or Adam Box or uh, Hashcash, right? So, and then you had, um, you had uh, Adam, not Adam, you had Nick Zabo with Bitgold. Uh, don't forget that before that was Liberty Reserve. So these are all different iterations of cryptocurrencies that people tried to create. Um, you had DigiCash uh, or Charmian Cash. So I, b I believe that Satoshi is a group, of, a group of those cryptographers that was on that list that were working on, on, on those projects is what I believe personally. Um, and obviously, I do not believe that uh, Craig is Satoshi at all um at all so but there were various various versions of cryptocurrency that people tried to create prior to bitcoin but they all failed for you know different reasons the the, the real genius thing about bitcoin preventing the double spend was really proof of work right the whole idea of the timestamp server so but like you know that's why i laugh at people when they say like oh blockchain technology is new no the blockchain goes back to xerox and Stuart haber Right. He was already d discussing that, you know, cryptography goes back to the ancient Egyptians, the idea of encrypting messages in the public. Right. You know, Caesar cipher, all of these things. So um, this technology isn't new. Distributed networking isn't new. Computer networking isn't new. Cryptography isn't new. Hash functions are not new. Um, so Satoshi just simply blended existing technology together. And when I say Satoshi, that group of people and they finally figured out a way to um solve the double spending problem because that's one of the hardest things with with when you think about something being digital it's very easy to recreate it right just by copying and pasting it so you have to you have to figure out a way to make someone do some type of computation right where therefore you know for a fact that a person didn't just create this out of thin air that they had to do some type of computation in order to arrive at, arrive at that conclusion so you know, I believe that it's just a, a a group of people. Some people say it's the NSA. Um, no, it's not the NSA. The governments are not that bright. They used to be because the the way that funding was set up is the smart people would go work for the government back in the day, um, because that's like literally where the money was at. But now you don't have to work for the government because uh, private companies have more funding and money than the government. Um, so, um, Gervais says full agreement. Yeah. Um, yeah, they had to create Satoshi to cover themselves. So, um, definitely. Definitely, they they had to do that. Um, when you when you study Bitcoin, you have such a great a great appreciation. You can tell that it was created. It, there are certain things that were embedded into Bitcoin purposely. Uh, you know, so like even how like the code is spaghetti code. It's not modular, meaning that like they purposely made it where like you can't really upgrade it if you wanted to, and if you try to upgrade it, you you break things in other places. Like these things were all designed for a reason. Uh, <laughs> Ripple Charge believe Garlic Brad Garlic House is the real Satoshi. I mean, some people say Sergey is nah. It, I believe that the real Satoshi is the group of cryptographers that was on that mailing list. Um. So, but again, the story is it's when you study cryptography and and you you see all of the iterations that the technology went through. Um, you have such a great appreciation for what we can, what, where we are now. And this is why, you know, I, I laugh at a lot of the people who they try to, you know, sell blockchain, not Bitcoin, right? Like blockchains always uh, have always existed. A blockchain is just a database. So like when people say, oh, you know, I believe in a blockchain. I don't believe in Bitcoin. It's like, oh, okay. Okay.
<laughs> oh, okay, idiot. Like blockchains have always existed. It's just, you know, <laughs> the the level of mental gymnastics that you have to like literally play with yourself to somehow discredit this technology is just it it's it's laughable like so many people are born in the right place at the right time and and they they could just get it so wrong like you could literally be born in the right place at the right time like bitcoin went from being valued at nothing worth 0 cents to it's worth well not today but it was worth a trillion dollars and you have like some people like Peter Schiff who they've been wrong for 10 years, for 12 years, and they just keep getting it wrong. I don't understand. Like, I, I just I don't get it. Seeing how, you know, just disruptive technology is in general that you can't see this. It's just but that's how I know that we're going to get filthy rich. Because it's so obvious to us, but there's so many people fighting us along the way. Right. Like. Every time we break another barrier, like they, they, it's like, like you're fighting a boss and every time we hit a new level, they try to come with like, oh, what about this? And what about this? And what about this? And it's just like, Bitcoin just keeps chugging along. It just keeps chugging along. And it's just, it's just, it's funny to watch people just keep getting it wrong. Like how, how can you get this so wrong? It's so obvious. It's in your face. I, I just don't get it. Mm -hmm. uh christopher lawless what what i would say if you if you really want to um there's a a bitcoin mit course that you can get into um it's free on youtube just type in bitcoin mit so and then like there's um if you're in computer science like they have like you know minors in cybersecurity. And even like a crypto, a crypto, a cryptography class. So you can find them on YouTube for free. <laughs> they are trying to will it to fail. Um, they know they'll have to compete. Schiff is a genius with his knowledge, with the economy and gold, but I can never trust them with any crypto advice. Yeah, and it's just, what's weird about Peter Schiff is he would have been perfect for Bitcoin, right? Remember, his dad went to prison for not want to, wanting to pay taxes. He's into the whole libertarian ideology. Um, he predicted the, 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 the crash of uh, 2008. Like, he could have parlayed, he would have been perfect for, he would have been a perfect Bitcoin poster child. Um, but it's like his, again, his emotion and his love for gold overpowers the, um, just logic. I don't get it. <laughs> uh, XRP rails. Who do you trust more Vitalik or Swartz? I trust neither one of them. Neither. Max Kaiser's another show too, though. So you got you have to be careful with listening to Max too. He's another personality. Um, you just you 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 have to you have to you have to understand that everyone, everyone has an agenda. I have an agenda, right? We all have agendas. And you just have to make sure that people who are speaking to you, that their agendas align with what's best for you. That's the most important thing. Like, for example, you know, like you may be a ripple bow, right? My agenda doesn't align with you. So you shouldn't listen to me, right? You should listen to other people um, that, that, you know, basically are aligning with the things you want to. But yeah, like Army um, Mato said, I can't, I can't really see it so small. I'm just going to say Army. Yeah, I, I don't trust individuals. I trust code. And again, when you've developed and built some things, you, I, I just I know what ETH can do and what ETH can't do. And the people who I've learned from, uh, they're very, very brilliant, smart people, highly intelligent. And um, they disagree on a lot of things, which is beautiful. I, I, I never see any of them talk bad about Ethereum like it's dead. It's going to die or any of these other things. And then as you watch people say things and then deliver on the things that they say, even if it may take a while, you start to build more confidence 
in, in where you are and what you're doing. And I, I, like I said before, I've been around crypto for a very long time. I, I, I witnessed EOS raise $4 billion and, and Dan talk about how, you know, they were going to have all of these different chains and they were going to launch all these different projects and all of these different things. And then EOS flaked out and turned into nothing. Yeah, it's called Open Courseware. Um, Todd Mac. They they have a MIT course where they get into you know cryptography, hash functions, rolling your own crypto, ECDSA, or you know Diffie Hellman, different different schemes, different encryption schemes. So, um, you know, I, I'm just uh, I I I just literally I sit here all day long and I just watch videos, read books, watch videos, read books, talk to people. You know, um, and this is why I'm bigger for paying for information. I'm in so many different Slack groups and Telegram channels and paid groups so I can pick the brains of other people who are smarter than me or who may have more experience with databases and sharding databases and things of that nature. You pay for information. You pay for access to networks. Think about it. Why do you think it's so expensive to go to Harvard versus your community college? It's not that you're learning anything different at Harvard than you can learn from your computer or from your local community college, what you're paying for at Harvard is access to a network, right? Because your your network is going to basically create your net worth, right? Because you're going to school with other kids who their parents are politicians, they're executives and CEOs at companies, and their parents are going to hand them the keys to the kingdom, right? So you're paying that $100,000 to go to Harvard to get that education, not because a degree is going to do anything for you, but like you're rubbing elbows with royalty, right? Like with, with people who they have uh, status in society or will have status. That's what you're paying for. Access to Harvard's network is effectively what you're, um, uh, what you're paying for, right? So I'm in so many different groups because I want access to networks and information that you're not going, like you could spend, think about this. You could spend five hours looking for free information and you might find the free information or you could spend $50, get into a group and a person gives you the free information. Well, I mean, not to give you the information that you found for free, right? So it may take you five hours to find it for free versus literally paying and becoming a member and you get the information within a matter of minutes, right? So time matters. So I, I believe in paying for information because I want to pay a person to get me straight to the point of making money. Right. See, this is, this is, this is how I think, right? Like I, I don't, I'm not going to sit around here and be like, oh man, he's trying to scam me because he's trying to get me for $50. Hell no. That's all you charging. All right. Because I want to be able to take that information and I want to, that five hours I spent looking for the information, that's five hours I could have spent learning the information. Right, right. See, so, so like I, I get straight to the point why well, spend five hours reading forums, going here, going there when I could just pay you oh, $50, $100, boom, and we go. Because at the end of the day, it's a tax write off anyway for my business. I, I have to, uh, so I spend thousands of dollars on education, especially like with coding and programming. Like a lot of you are going to be blown away by this new web development um, course that I've, I've put together for you guys. I've, I've, I've taken a lot of time. And, and energy just to really sit down and really put things together in a proper context. <laughs> so. Um. When you listen, all opinions you can have, you know, more expect uh, perspectives. Yeah. Um, uh, I'll share that with you at a later date, John P. It's, it's interesting. We're coming up on 2 hours and 33 minutes. Yeah. It, it, so the way that my web developer course is going to go, the way I'm structuring it, is because remember when I when I did the the JavaScript bootcamp, Solidity is very similar to JavaScript, right? So I wanted to briefly cover HTML because I felt that it's easier to learn by just building things, but many of you didn't feel that way. 
And when I get something wrong, I just keep it real and say I got it wrong. Right. So I miss. I miscalculated that. I thought that if I could just jump right into building things that you'll naturally pick it up because, you know, I just I've been coding and doing things since uh, like high school, like basic HTML sites and stuff like that. So I figured that everyone knew a little bit of that. But, you know, and no knock to you guys, but some of you um, like you've never touched your command line on your computer. You have no idea what a repository is. You don't know what a protocol is. You don't know what your web browser actually is doing behind the scenes. So the way that the course is structured, I'm going to cover the very, very basics. Like what is a client? What is a server? What is the internet backbone? Um, get into that stuff. What is a URL? Um, and then we go into HTML because that's the structure of your page. Then we go into CSS. That's the styling of your page. Then we get into JavaScript. Right. And then we're going to cover a framework like bootstrap. Um, then we get into databases. So um, just going iterating step by step. So it's probably going to take about 24 weeks, maybe 30 weeks altogether for you to, I would say, even like for us to really get up to like full scale applications. But I think it'd be better that way because now it's easier for me to work with who's in there now and build you up. And then as the people come behind, they can just follow in what we've already been building and doing. So I think that that would be better. Well, re re well remember, Remember that the Oracle already knew everything, John P. Right? So when Neo when Neo goes when Neo went to, went to meet her, she knew that Neo was going to knock over the vase, right? So she already knew what the outcome was going to be. She was guiding Neo to come to a certain conclusion. This goes back to control, right? Because they had to figure out a way to balance the equation. So when he's talking to the the architect and the architect saying, well, if I'm the father of the matrix, then she's definitely the mother. Right. So the whole idea was to make Neo think that he had a choice, but he really didn't. And this is why she gave him the cookie. Like so when you go on like your Web page, your page, it cookies you right, follows you. So when she gave him the cookie, it made him have a heightened sense of love for Trinity. Right. So basically, the Oracle was manipulating him the whole time and she was manipulating Morpheus. So this is why it's going to be um, interesting watching the Matrix 4 when it comes out, because there's a lot of interesting theories about that. But the, the whole time, the, um, the, the Oracle was definitely um, manipulating Neo. And she knew what the outcome was going to be because she was the one leading him in that direction. So get real, the Matrix is one of my favorite movies. Uh, by far, um, if I had to pick a, a character in the Matrix, I'm the Merovingian, right? Because I I understand that there will always be a form of control. I just want to make sure that I'm controlling the control. Uh -huh. So it was very very interesting. Uh, well, it, it it makes her a villain. Because she was filling Morpheus in on their heads up with with the idea that they were fighting a battle that they could win, but the machines had already won. It was always control. It was always designed to be that. Zion was just another form of control. Um So really good movie. Like I said, uh, I'm interesting to see how part four plays out with the matrix. Really, really interesting because there are some theories that they're saying that the machines never won and that the matrix is a simulation for the machines getting ready to attack the humans. Right. So, so like they're basically studying Neo and studying Morpheus and all of these people, but that the machines never really even won the war that it's just a simulation with the machines practicing getting ready to rebel against the humans. 
So there, there's some really exciting um, theories and stuff that's coming out, and I, I love I love it because it's so applicable to our day to day lives. Right. So it's 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 like it's it's a lot. It's one of my by f that Inception. I love Inception. I love the Matrix. I love Inception. Um. There's a book that the Matrix is based off, based on on um, Bodhya Rao. I don't know how to say his name. Um, that they Neo actually had the book in the beginning in the opening scene. So then Plato's allegories, another um, or say like story that you can read. Yeah, it has a lot of biblical meanings in it as well too, right? So it's just. Across the board, it's it's a lot of it's a lot of wisdom in that movie, man. A lot of wisdom, if you um are looking for it, right? A lot of wisdom in that movie. But guys, we're coming up on two hours and forty minutes, so um uh, definitely definitely um doing a lot of talking outside of crypto. <laughs> but this is what happens. We get together sometimes. We just talk because there's not much going on. Um, so again, thank you to everybody that don't everyone that donated. I'm gonna wrap it up here. If you're interested in joining the academy, the link is in the description below. I'll put a link in the chat. Uh, please like the video, share the video, subscribe, hit the notification bell. Um, we'll definitely we'll definitely get together and and build and um you know talk about some stuff on the weekend. On Saturday, we are going well. I'm going to cover Theta and Zilliqa. Um, interested in those projects. A lot of you have been asking me to cover them, so that's what I'll be doing this weekend. Uh, for those of you who were just earlier in the community meeting that we had, um, again, it's uploading. These The files are large. They're like five to seven gigabytes, so it takes a while for Kajabi to process it and load it up. So, ended here. See you guys on the weekend.